mine for today. You don't mess with the wrong oh, I don't have my witch. <laughs> Welcome good, to Covenant. Good thing that we're going now, because uh, <laughs> Brian Kane did not put his headset on. He did not. Anyway, um, welcome to Covenant. This is... We, Tiki's falling off my lap. We're at the house again, so things are a little thrown off because the internet uh, the internet went down in the quarter. As you know, we've been having problems. So we're getting something installed there, that fiber optics thing that should fix the problem. He's but before I put my headset on, um, this is Season 3, Episode 8 of Covenant live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, please visit our YouTube channel on Hex Education. Click subscribe so you can follow the archive of all of our past videos and promote it in that, in that situation. So today's episode is Witchcraft, Planetary Magic, and Levi Rowland's new book, The Art Cosmic, published by Warlock Press. I am one of the publishers. Not one of the editors, one of the publishers. Um, which basically means my name's on the ink, right? Uh, but no, uh, Levi, Levi obviously was someone I really wanted to write a book for us because he is such a great academic, you know, Trying. and a student of the occult and craft. So I thought, you know, whatever he writes, he's going to do great. And he chose, um, you know, one of the things we won't do in Warlock's uh, Press, or I hope we have never do in Warlock's Press, is tell the writers what we want from them. Like, you should write what you want to write. So we discussed what he was going to write. He was, you know, he thought about writing about the goddess. He thought about writing about several other things. But in the end, this is what he wanted to write about. It is. It was his passion, and I'm super excited about that. These are always weird, these ones here. You're doing great. Um, I believe in you. They're new. Hold on. They just don't quite seem to like they fit quite right. So many people are commenting about how it, they recognize that we're on the wrong sides. Well, we're on the wrong sides because okay, I I can't hear myself in my headset. So probably should have tested that instead of making sure the phone was working. Um, yeah, you turned up. You I don't hear anything. Check and see if you're plugged in. I don't know where it plugged in. One to. second, everybody. Technical difficulties every time we do the show in a new location. Uh, Oh, there we go. There we go. We got it. I think there's something wrong with the wire, because I barely touched it, and it started working. So, I don't know. But anyway, yes, I can hear myself now. So anyway, very excited about this topic. Um, of course, you don't have any wine, but blessed be. Blessed be. Um, couldn't even get him to get a Coca-Cola today. I know. So, witchcraft and planetary magic, and its relation to the Alexandrian tradition. So I wanted to speak a little bit about that, and then Levi's going to speak a little bit about that from his periphery, and then I'm going to ask some questions about his book. Of course, we would love it if you call in. You can call in, you can ask questions on the subject of witchcraft or Alexandrian witchcraft or the topic we're discussing tonight, mm -hmm. and so we're open to other, doesn't have to be on the topic, but we're open to all things. Um, Levi's book is already uh, ready for, it's already available for pre-release. Uh, not having my headset like really threw me off at uh, hexwitch.com and I think it's salemomen.com or is it omensalem.com I don't know one of those works um, you can pre-release it there pre-order it there um, and it's available so um, yay. yay it's exciting exciting super exciting so first I'm going to talk about the relationship between planetary magic and witchcraft and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of planetary magic in relation to Alexandrian witchcraft, and then hand, hand the baton over to Levi, the baton. who's more of the expert on the subject of actual astrology, planetary magic. Um, but, you know, I know the subject in relation to, to the things that, that pertain to the priesthood. So what I could basically say to you is that early on, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of influence with planetary magic in the craft. Like, it's not actually witchcraft from our periphery mm -hmm. in itself. And we, te you know, we do, we do study it. We do obviously get exposed to it. I think it really affected some of the early witches because it affected, like, maybe some of their color correspondences and things like that or how they felt about certain metals based yep. on the Key of Solomon. And I think that goes back to Gardner. Like, I think that that was an early occult... I think that occult influence of Key of Solomon and planetary magic affected many occult traditions. You know, the Golden Dawn, probably the OTO, uh, witchcraft, and probably mm -hmm. other many other traditions. So I think it just had a Western occult influence anyway. 
So even if they weren't thinking they were doing planetary magic because they were lighting their candle black for this particular purpose, that color, may the, the magical correspondence was probably coming from the Key of Solomon. So in a sense, it was going back to planetary magic because the Key of Solomon, most people probably don't realize, is literally a book on planetary magic. Like mm -hmm. that's basically all it is. You know, it's it's got all these different spirits and methods, but it's pinnacles that are planetary in origin for particular purposes. And the spirits written on those pinnacles are supposed to correspond to those planets. Yep. You know, that's basically the, the thing. So fast forward, the first witch, who I don't think one has done it since this witch, is Patricia Crowther. And she did some work with planetary magic, and it was a part of her, like, what we would call outer court work. Mm -hmm. Because initiates don't tend to give you our witchy magics. You know, there's always a couple oath breakers out there, whatever, but for the most part, we'll steer, steer, steer clear of that. And Patricia Crowther, I think it was one of her methods of doing it, was to use planetary magic in her books. So, like, on Lid of the Cauldron, she has rights to all the seven, what we call the seven planets, or the seven luminaries, because the moon and the sun are technically planets. But, you know, Levi will probably get into that a lot more. We will. So, um, you know, that's what she focused on. She also did these wonderful things, and I don't know what book this might have appeared in off the top of my head, but she had rituals for the Zodiac as well, and you can yep. actually find the videos of those on YouTube now. So if you uh, Google Patricia Crowther and the Zodiac, you could find a ritual for Leo and a ritual for Taurus and a like kind of a pathworking ritual. I believe it's called Initiation Through the Zodiac. Yeah, um, but I don't know what book it appeared in right now. I think now. that is the book. Oh, is it the book? I'm going um, to check. Lit Off the Cauldron was my first exposure to Patricia and uh, the planetary thing, mm -hmm. and it's that's more along the lines of what Levi's going to be talking about. The Zodiac Experience, Initiation Through the Twelve Yes, signs. and I do not have that book, honestly, unless it once had a different name. We're carrying it at Hex now. Oh, uh, I'll have to get it. Yeah. Um, but I've seen the videos because they're, on, they're yeah. available on YouTube. It was probably originally an audio tape of hers because she did a lot of audio tapes. Um, and so that, that's probably a thing. She had her own radio. She was one of the first witches that had her own radio blog thing. You know, it was called The Witching Hour, I believe. I think it was The Witching Hour. Um, but anyway, so not since her has anyone really addressed it. And she didn't put it forward that it was witchcraft. It was just what she was willing to share with, with the public. But what she did is she sort of put the craft through the lens of the Zodiac or the craft through the lens of the planet. So you, mm -hmm. If you know anything about craft, you see it in there to some extent. You absolutely and do. It's beautiful. So, so that was there. But Gardenarians are not really known for their association with planetary magic. I'm sure, I'm sure they all do it now, right? But it, the tradition isn't known. Whereas a lot of people have like sort of this misconception, I think it is, that Alexandrians, you know, what, what people will usually say is Alexandrians are also ceremonial magicians, or we've incorporated the Kabbalah and a lot more ceremonial magic into our craft. That is true and untrue, because here's the thing, we don't actually incorporate it into our craft, and we don't require it. No. So the Kabbalah, angelics, planetary magic, things like that, they are things that a lot of Alexandrians pursue, a lot of Alexandrian covens explore, but it's not required and it's not considered craft training or craft magic. It's, mm -hmm. it's separate. Um, here in the New Orleans coven, we absolutely have explored both the Kabbalah and planetary magic and, and different versions. Now, it began with Alex, because on the side of being a witch, he was also a magician. And his two favorite go-to grimoires, because if you're a magician, you've got to have go-to grimoires, was The Key of Solomon, we've already discussed, and a book called The Magus. And The Magus is actually really highly underrated in a lot of ways because it was actually very accessible. One of my favorite historical points about The Magus is it was extremely popular in Wales around the time that Alex was growing up. Mm -hmm. if, I don't know why, but it was a popular book sold in Wales. So it was very available. It's been, uh, it was published, I think, in the 1800s or something like that. And it, it is a version of the Key of Solomon. What people don't understand is the Solomonic manuscripts have many versions. What most of us have been uh, exposed to is McGregor Matthews' translation. That's the go-to. Yeah, people know, love Le Mathers. Levi might discuss that more as well. Um, I'm sure he's not going to tell you his whole book tonight because we want you to buy it. But it, he's going he's gonna to have some things. I'm going to ask him some questions. So um, that's that, you know, and in my coven, um, we do study planetary magic, 
but it is seen as something separate than craft, and we do use McGregor Matthews version for the most part, and the Magus as our go-tos for what we explore there. But we're also very creative, and I think we do tend to look through it through the lens of the craft. For instance, I created myself visual path workings for the seven planets that we've used in the group. You know, it's something I created. Obviously, it's going to come through the lens of the craft, because <laughs> on craft, right? Um, so, very excited. Um, so, before I start asking you questions or we start taking callers, Levi, why don't you give us a, a drop down of, well, what I just did, really. What you just yeah, did. Yeah, and then why you wrote the book. Absolutely. The Art Cosmic. The Art Cosmic. By Levi Rowland. The Magic of Traditional Astrology. Uh, <laughs> thank you to all the wonderful crazy. comments we got. I'm so glad you're here. Blessed be, Carrie. Blessed be to any initiates watching. I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to let Brian fix his ears and tell you. Um, so the Art Cosmic is an expression of traditional astrology, and it is written from the perspective that astrology is inseparable from magic. And I make this argument in the book, and it's kind of a controversial argument. Not everyone agrees. A lot of astrologers view astrology as a form of science, cause and effect knowledge, right? Like, we look at the planets, they mean this, we interpret that, and there you go. I make an argument in the book that there is a long tradition in astrology of it being basically a magical divinatory view, that it's a separate worldview from what would later become astronomy, as opposed to just a failed attempt at early astronomy, which is sort of the narrative everyone has. So I wrote it as a witch, right? You know, as somebody who believes in magic and practices magic and views astrology as a tool for that, right? And hopefully you will too. The whole goal of this book is goal of this book is to introduce you to the way astrology was worked before it was made into a science in the modern world and it was sort of gutted of its of its spiritual tradition. Um, that was a purposeful act that people did, and what it did, in my opinion, was make an astrology that was quite empty, really, of, of any sort of spiritual meaning. It was not holistic anymore. It, it had lost its, its connection to, to magic. And so I really hope that the Art Cosmic is an introduction to that system for people who either have no experience in astrology, which you can definitely benefit from the book if you don't, or if you have experience in astrology, but it's solely from modern astrology, right? So traditional astrology is different, and we'll discuss throughout the show many ways, I'm sure, that they're different and similar with your questions. Um, but that is the, the main reason I wrote the book, right, is there, this is a magical system, and it is inseparable from that. One of the things I talk about early in the book that I think is a great way to show this is the magi, where, you know, the term where we get the same root term as magic, were astrologers. That's literally what it meant, right? The magi, the Chaldeans, you know, these worlds were not separable. So we already have callers, by the way. So do you think, yes, but we've got a wonderful cue, so we don't we take them right away. Um, so please keep listening. We'll start take, taking callers in just a few minutes. Um, but I, one of the things is that, you know, we want to cover the material. And I do you think that the biblical reference of the uh, three kings and Jesus and the star of Bethlehem was a reference to the Magi and astrology? Oh, absolutely. They're astrologers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and it's, it's funny because the Romans and the Greeks, you know, when they took in astrology, they viewed it as a Babylonian art. Origin. That, that's where it was, its yeah. origins were, which that is where the origins of Western astrology are. They come from, you know... Mesopotamia, right? Um, the Enuma Anu and Enlil was the first astrological codex ever written. Um, some of the oldest things that we have on this planet that are written down in any language are about astrology. That's just the truth. In Sanskrit, am I saying that right? No, cuneiform. Oh. Cuneiform. Okay. So way before Sanskrit, actually. Oh, okay. That's how old it is. Oh. And yeah. Sanskrit's the one with the little lines, isn't it? No, that's cuneiform. Sanskrit's the curly one that's used to write. Oh, I was thinking of that then. Uh, yeah. Indic languages, yeah. Dharmic. I think some people might call that Sanskrit. I'm not. Yeah. I'm Cune not an expert. Yeah, cuneiform uh. was the, the alphabet used to write Akkadian and Babylonian mm. and Sumerian, right? But, um, but yeah, it's very old. And, uh, but when they brought it into Greece and Rome, they did this thing where they, they, they viewed it as somewhat foreign in the beginning before they brought it in because it was seen as so magical. You know, it was so powerful that under Augustus it was illegal to do astrology except for, you know, the imperial court, you know, in, in many places in the Roman Empire. So it became something they knew it was magical. So that's always been at the root of it. It's something I think is really important. So in your book, The Art Cosmic, how much craft comes through in your... Well, first, before I get to that, actually, more important question for, for the audience is you did speak to me about how this book is... Um, old astrology versus new astrology. Could yes. you explain that to the people? And then I have another question. Yes. So I, that's what I wanted to be one of the first questions, which is that um, 
Traditional astrology is a Traditional term. astrology, thank you. Yeah, but it's, you can call it old too. Like traditional astrology, which is part of the subtitle of the book, is a form of astrology. When we use that term, we're talking about the astrologies, basically, that were practiced before the scientific revolution, right? Before we had access to the outer planets. And it's a system that's based heavily in sort of Neoplatonic thought. It's European, it's Eurocentric, that's very true. Um, and it does not incorporate the planets past Saturn. It does not incorporate asteroids. It does not incorporate comets or anything like that, like modern astrology does. And it is geocentric, meaning it starts from the Earth. So you don't talk about Vulcan. Mm -mm. We don't talk <laughs> about where your Chiron is or, or where Uranus is or whatever. We don't do that in traditional astrology. And there's very in intense reasons for why we don't do that. And it's because the outer planets are not visible with the naked eye. They are not part of the holistic experience of what it is to be a human on this Earth without assisted technology. And the time frames that you deal with when you deal with the outer planets are much larger than most human lives can understand. I mean, I think Uranus is an 80-some year revolution, but the next one is, is over 100. They are incredibly slow moving and far away. And the other reason we don't use them is because they're still not totally defined. I mean, we're still debating what Pluto is. Chiron, which you go pick up a modern astrology book, they will tell you that it is an asteroid, when in fact now science is saying it's probably not. You know, it might be something else. So it's too far away. I call them like sort of the dread lords of the outer spaces in the book, right? You know, Could like it be an alien space Yeah, space. they're too Cthulhu-ish for <laughs> us. A little Lovecraftian, right? Um, we just, we don't use them. So traditional astrology does do that. And trad astrology is holistic. You know, it works very heavily with the elements. It works with the modes, which you might have seen in your horoscope as cardinal, mutable, fixed, etc. It, it views all of these as a complex unity, and it's balanced. So the best example of this is, we're, this is something that ties it somewhat back to craft. In traditional astrology, we care more about the seasons and about our experience here on Earth. So the question I asked in, you know, to introduce this to people is, why is Aries, when you read about Aries, why are they always considered go-getters and beginners of things and whatnot? Because of the time of the year. Because it's say. the spring equinox. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, and why are, why are Capricorns and Aquarians inwardly turned or workaholics or whatever the stereotypes about them are? They're the winter. Yeah, the, the, of winter. the wheel of the year is also the wheel of the zodiac, if you know how to read it. Absolutely. You know, um, Absolutely. And it makes sense to witches. I think that's why, you know, but that was my next question. How, you know, where, where in the book do you translate it? Well, I'm sure you, well, I don't want to answer the question. But <laughs> how, is, how does the book relate to your craft and, or does it at all? I was very careful about this. Um, I think I have one or two mentions of witchcraft when it comes to the moon as a, as, a, as a cosmic sphere, as a sort of celestial object. But I didn't relate them at all, actually. I view traditional astrology and planetary magic as its own world. And I agree with Brian, you don't need it to be a witch, right? I am, I am an avid lover of astrological magic and traditional astrology, but I don't think I need it for my witchcraft. In our magical imaginations, witchcraft predates the knowledge of those other planets. But yeah. we knew about the sun and the moon. <laughs> exactly. You know, witchcraft is tapping yeah. into a very different egregore, is what I would say. And what I really agree with Levi in is, because I also, um, in my magics, you know, because where I use a straw, I don't really do the zodiac in my magic very much. You know, it's a, it's a fun thing to observe. I'd have, I've had my chart done, you know, I believe in it to some degree. I love the connection with it and the myth. Yes. Of the gods. Like, mm -hmm. do you think, because I've always imagined, that there is kind of a relation between the Zodiac and, like, the Twelve Olympians? I think there's a deep relationship between the concept of the stars as living gods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is something I talk about in the Art Cosmic, which is they're, they're, they are living gods to the ancients. They're named after the Roman gods. Yeah, they're named after the... Our, our current names for the planets are Roman gods. In Vedic astrology, which is the Hindu form of astrology in India, they're named after gods. Um, they are gods to the ancients. And they actually viewed them as the home of gods. You know what I mean? Or as the living incarnations of them in the night sky. Alien. So Venus was Ishtar, you know, or whatever, in, in certain cultures. And she was the, you know, the evening and the morning star. Uh, this is not, this is, or Jupiter was, you know, was, was a supreme god in Mesopotamia, um, you know, which changed over time. But they really did view them as gods. And it's the same with constellations. You know, they saw them as living, actual celestial figures. Well, one of the things I love that, that uh, Patricia Crowther says is that witchcraft is 
not just a religion of the past and not just a religion of the new age, but a religion of the space age. So that priestess had a vision that we were going to go beyond this planet. We were going to understand the universe. And, you know, we do often say in the circle that the goddess is the goddess of the whole universe. It's not just the goddess of this planet, you know. And, you know, I think that one thing that astrology and witchcraft does have in common, uh, which comes from our both of our sharing the same, you know, ancient past, is that we do see our gods in physical things. Yes. We don't necessarily think they are those physical things, but we see them in those physical things. So, for instance, Jupiter, you know, may not have any power unto itself, but it's been in the occult fed for thousands of years. As all an this egregore. power, mm-hmm. as an egregore. It's become like an altar in space. Or who knows? Maybe, maybe Zeus is really sitting on it. But I kind of, it's very funny that Brian uses the term altars because that's a term yeah. that um, I actually use that term in the, yeah. in, because the, one of the Neoplatonists that I love calls the stars the living altars of the gods. You know? yeah. um, that is what they mm-hmm. were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in, in a lot of traditional mythologies, um, Gnostic mythology, you know, um, Neoplatonic mythology, the stars were the interregnum, basically, the intermediary world between the absolute God and our existence. So the power of God literally flows through the stars and we interpret it in this cosmic fatalistic drama that is magic, right? And we are participating in that. I'm actually reading a book right now by Chris Godson, a fantastic book. It's called Magic, um, A History, from Ice Age to the Present, from Alchemy to Witchcraft or something like that. But it's Chris Godson and he's a scholar at Oxford, fantastic history of magic and he has my new favorite definition of magic. Is he an occultist? No, he is an academic. But That's he is, all right. But you will love his definition of magic. Yes. He has a definition of magic where he separates it, because it's very tricky to separate magic from religion and science. You know, and that's the well, in th- our world, you can't. You can't. Right. And he's trying to understand, it, as an anthropologist and a cultural archaeologist, what is magic. And he defines it as the belief that you participate in the universe and it participates in you. You know, and Co-creation. Yeah, exactly. That magic is not like religion, because religion forces... Well, we would disagree, but he's saying that Abrahamic religion, which we aren't, shifts all the focus to God. And then he's saying science is observation, right? And transformation only in the laws of Newtonian physics or whatever, or quantum physics. But magic is the belief that as I participate in this, it participates within me. I love so that. So I think we should probably start taking some calls. We should. I've left one person on talk. On, okay. Hi, welcome to Covendom. Hi, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Good. My name is Dan Doherty. I'm a witch over here in the Coven in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, first of all, blessed be, brother, blessed be. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for calling. I was wondering, um, what, uh, what do you guys have any suggestions? Do you have any suggestions as far as what size of a witch broom to stick up my anus? Uh, you would need a rather large one. Get rid of it. <laughs> oh, that oh, was fun. We got our first troll. We did. Congratulations. Big like surprise. Uh, next caller. Oh, we do have another one. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's the one I dropped. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Well, I thought you had more than one. Huh. Uh, he would need a very large one, I think. Uh, probably already a garbage disposal. <laughs> anyway. Um, so. <laughs> so hateful. That. Oof. Not me, that poor little sad man. Um, you know, we we did expect when we got the when we did this live thing, we would get some sort of weird rude callers. Yeah, I know you can ban the calls, but it was anonymous. Not um, really hard. It's not really um, unanticipated, but it's entertaining anyway. We'll have fun with it. Uh, yeah, I, mean, um, I don't care. So uh, Water off uh, Brian a Thompson asked a question um, up a little further mm-hmm. that I kind of am going to address. Um, as far as your, you know, I don't know what tradition you are in, so I'm not going to confirm or, or anything what you think we do, nor would I anyway. Um, but as far as the lunar hexagram, do you use that in any of your planetary magics? It's the Golden Dawn 
planetary ones. I didn't. Um, yeah. I used pentagrams. Um, I used invoking pentagrams in certain rituals, absolutely, um, and banishing pentagrams. Um, some of the, the rituals in the book are supposed to be, because there's a ritual for every planet. There's a ritual for the stars. Um, there's a ritual for divination. There's a lot of ritual in the book, because, again, it's a magical book. But I did try to make sure that it was not one type of ritual. So there are some rituals that are quite Solomonic. Um, they use banishing, they use exercising, they use all the things that you would see in a lot of Solomonic ritual. They use angel names and things like that. Um, and then there are some that are a little bit more folk magic inspired because I wanted to show that planetary magic really does sort of run the gamut. Okay, So we do have two more. You'll have to learn how to ban them. I know. Hi, welcome to Covendom. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, welcome to Covington. I can hear myself in the background. Are you calling yourself? No. <laughs> They've got the, where they got it turned on. Hi, you're on the air. So sorry, that. guys. Try. Okay, we've got another one, though. What well, makes you do, like, all this little duty dad thing? Oh, there's I, Ben right there. You just got to look for it. It was anonymous, though. Hi, welcome to Covington. You should still be okay. Bless be. Hi, how are you? Hi, who's calling? Um, my name is Dawn, and I'm from New York. Hey, Hi, Dawn. Hi, I have been a big fan of yours, and I've been watching you for a very long time now. Thank you. And I have a question, not about the planet. I've actually got a question about Alexandrian tradition. Sure. And I... I'm a little confused about it, something. Well, first of all, it's a two-part question. I apologize. One is, I am wondering, when will you have another soiree? Okay, I'll let you answer that. Well, soirees are done by covens, right? So, obviously, because of the pandemic, most people aren't meeting people. <laughs> So probably after uh, vaccinations take more effect and there are more people who are vaccinated and we feel like we're sufficiently vaccinated, we will begin to open up in the world just like everything else. So really that's about the pandemic. Normally we try to have a couple a year or at least one public one a year. And then, but all a soiree really was, or where it comes from in the Alexandrian tradition, is that Alex and Maxine would open up their home and their London flat and have people in and have discussions and talks to where speakers could ask questions about witchcraft. Yeah. So a soiree can or cannot be public. Like if it was in my home, I wouldn't advertise it on Facebook. <laughs> What was part and, of my my second Okay. Oh, can you turn your uh, <laughs> my my second your... question is this. My, my, my second is um okay. People learn at a different rate, obviously. <laughs> my, my You're going to have to turn your computer off cuz we can hear our echo. You can't control that. And, um okay. People learn at a different rate, obviously. Yeah, what makes... Yeah, I, I, I'm having a hard time here, too. I'm sorry. Is this better? Yeah, just yeah. ask the question and we'll yeah. answer it. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Um, my question is this. People learn at a different rate. And what makes them worthy of... Learning uh, the Alexandrian tradition, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Initiation. Initiation makes them worthy. That's the answer. Once an initiate. Gone. Yeah, once an initiate. <laughs> no, what there. makes a good initiate is what I'm trying to get at. I'm sorry. Oh. Well, a good initiate, I suppose, is one where the initiation takes. They're sincere. They're dedicated, they mean it, and they're about, set about doing the work. That's what I think makes a good initiate. I would agree with that. Uh, covens are going to have different types of people they gravitate to or feel comfortable with, or that vibe. You know, you know how you can uh, like five people in the room, but there may be a couple people in the room you just don't feel, you feel a disconnect from? Uh, there's a little intuition that goes into it, and any coven, of course, has the right to 
decline whoever they wish to. I mean, these are people you're going to let into your home and your personal life onto some level, right? So mm -hmm. it is it is going to be a choosy thing. But I think for the most part, most coven leaders are probably looking for sincerity, number one. Obviously, you know, intelligence would be a good thing, I would think. Being capable of doing the job, you know, um, I think that those are the things. I want people who have the spark of magic in them, who want to know, who aren't here to tell me what they already know, but they're here to learn, and that they're sincere in their vocation to become a priest or a priestess mm -hmm. of the goddess. Absolutely. So for me, that's what it is, but I can't answer for every high priesthood in the world. That, uh, thank you, thank you so much. I am so sorry that this was a complicated call. No, it's no, not your good. fault at all. You're good. Levi made it complicated. I did not. Yes, you've done this before. <laughs> oh, no, I love Levi to death. My so God, he's so but brilliant. He's cancer. <laughs> Cancers, they, you know, they start going. and it's just, oh, Here's God. the thing for the callers. If you call in and you've got your video playing on a speaker, it is going to complicate the call. But when they're already doing it, I found that trying to correct it then... It's just going to make you like, because they're going to go try to. Yeah. But thank you so, very much for calling yeah. in. It's a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. Good question. Very good question. Thank you so much. Blessed be to both of you. Thank you. you. Many blessings evening. to you. And much continued success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have another caller. Um, I love how Wicked Witches were blaming Levi. I am very well, used to this. He did this before with one of our coven members. She called in and she, he kept trying to correct it. And she couldn't hear him because the echo. I know. Because they're getting the echo. And so I'm watching this train wreck happen again. And I'm just like, just get the question Brian's out. Brian's like, we're cutting it out. Yes, tonight. just get the question out. Um, okay. You can't do anything about that. No. Really. I mean, you could drop the call and I say, know. call back without your speaker. But I don't want Welcome to, to Covendom. Hi, blessed be, it's Carrie. <gasps> blessed How be, are you this evening, Hello. gentlemen? Blessed uh, be. Blessed be. You know, it's really funny. I almost called you tonight about the show. <gasps> the symbolism oh. of it all. Oh, I love it. I love it. I sense it. Um, first, I have a few questions. Uh, the first question, I don't have any questions about a broom or where it needs to go. So <laughs> That's very important. I'm good on that end. Thank God. Well, good news, um, we already know where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we well, already know where it goes. Um, I'd... Uh, Levi, I'm very, very excited about your book. I'm Yay. super proud of you. Thank you, my love. Um, I did. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering, you know, with in your practice as an Alexandrian high priest and as an astrologer, like what was the inspiration to write the book? Had it been something you'd been thinking about for a few years and decided to do it? Or like what was your kind of the, the path or the progression that that led you to do it. Honestly, it's going to sound like it's a two, it's a two bold thing, two fold thing. And they're very interesting. One is, is it's my favorite. I like to call different occult systems, languages of magic. Like we're all fluent in multiple yes, languages of magic. I'm very fluent in astrology and it's one of my favorite magical languages. It's so holistic. It's so, you know, it's so cosmic mm -hmm. and massive. So it was the one I loved. You know what I mean? It's just, it's one of the languages of magic I love, you know? And the second reason was because I wanted something outside of myself a little bit. I wanted to look at something larger. And it's sort of, I think a lot of people in the modern world feel very small, feel very trapped. It's this nine to five world we live in. And there's something about yeah. the sort of like cosmic nature of astrology. It's so large. It's so, it's so massive, but yet so intimate because it's all about when you were born. You know, I think there's something sort of beautiful about that. And I liked that combo. So that was kind of my two, my two things. I love it. I'm really excited. I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. It looks really good. You'll really like it. Oh, I can't wait. And pretty. also, Brian, I wanted you to know that um, I'm ordering your book, the audio book, so I can listen to it in my car when I'm driving or running errands. So it'll be like you're in the car with me. Spiritually. It's not me, very, though. It's a very, it's a very thing. beautiful <laughs> London man speaking. It is. It's a great British uh, accent. Yes, it's a man with a British accent speaking. So like you. A real one. <laughs> and uh, a real, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't I was going to say it, but I didn't uh, say nothing. Yeah. Not my BBC, not Brian BBC, but um, we picked, actually, we actually literally picked the BBC accents that would be more like mine. But I, and we had thought oh about God, me so doing excited. it, but I did not. I'll be honest, I was too lazy to read my Was it Judy book. Dench? 
I did not want to read. I didn't want to like read my whole book <laughs> and like have to correct every mistake I made. Excuse me, Dame uh, Judy Dench. Like, first of all, I got Dame people, Judy Dench. I got Dame Brian Kane. That. But um, um, good. I'm glad you. I'm glad you did. Um, it has a very small section on blood tire magic. Um, but uh, oh, that's another question I wanted to ask you. How much, if at all, did the Key of Solomon uh, impact your work? I mean, did you escape it entirely, or is it still there? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> There's I will, no escape. Is it I escape it? I love Carrie Lane. I don't think you really can <laughs> no, either. you can't. I know he would try. Um, I, I used, <laughs> um, I did rebel in one small way, which is I did not use McGregor Mather's translation. I oh, used yes. Skinner's new translations of the Lost French Manuscripts, which was my own personal rebellion. Right. I thought Carrie would like that too. It's the same manuscripts, um, though. Yes, I, I do. <laughs> I do. McGregor Mathews didn't write it. He no. interpreted it, and, and there are probably people better at it now. Yeah. You know, I did I did avoid it on some level because... The colors are still the same, though, right? The colors are the same. The That's all I care about, mm-hmm. the colors than the medals, honestly. Um, I used it for correspondences a lot. I'll say that. I I, I used the key of So Solomon. you didn't completely Astrology, but make it fashion. Yeah, astrology, but make it fashion. Exactly. I really need new headsets. Okay, here's the whole thing. We are a multi-million dollar company, and I've got ghetto headsets that fall off my ears. Could somebody explain this to me? Okay. He's Just having a ball <laughs> carrying these headsets. Carry these Brian, they are always that, falling off I think my you're ears. Just they don't fit. Space and time. That's what it is. Anyway, no, it's not Christian's fault. I blame everyone else, mostly Levi. It's always Levi's fault. fault. No, Levi said they're fine. Let's use these ones. I, was, I will tell you guys, yeah. doing um, the show from home is looking in the face of raw. We are looking in the face of raw. We are. It's and if we don't come back blind from this, I don't know what I it'll be. I am going to learn braille. Like this will be in my dreams. This white circle. It's. The light is a white circle. I see it in, in, uh, in Levi's glasses. Yes. So yes. I've been like, it's that's like, what are we're staring at. Garden? It's like, like what's the Caroline. Hey, come into the light. Caroline, come into the light. I know. Oh, I'm like, is it a poltergeist? Is it a stargate? It is a so many questions. You know what it is? Maybe, maybe that if we had that guy's broom, we could figure it out and fly through. Like, it's, it's a, a journey. It's a journey. I'm actually very surprised that that's the first troll call we've had, honestly. I know. Uh, very, I'm very un- uncreative. You know what? God bless him. Yeah. He waited in the queue for quite some time too. So he was just so he waiting just to do that. <laughs> he was sitting there just ready for minutes, people. Minutes. Um, bless his heart. He's come well, to the wrong crowd Roman. if he's going to try to rattle these cages. Yes, Carrie, blessed um, be. Thank anyway, you so much. much. All right, blessed be. Thank you for calling. I wish you both. Love you. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye, darling. Carrie actually is a very good. Um, Obviously, she is an Alexandrian uh, priestess, and she has taught many classes on astrology and planetary mm-hmm. magic. Excellent astrology. And she actually is the one who did my chart. Mm-hmm. The only one who's ever done my chart. Oh, I'm looking at that again. The only one who's ever done my chart. So it's a very good topic for her. Anyway. Um, Fantastic. Okay, so we don't have a call in queue, so I'm going to go back. What does the screener mean? Don't worry about it. Oh, is Christian screening the calls now? No. Oh. I'm going to go back and look at some of the comments. Since we had some callers, I know that I missed a few of your comments. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, Jeeva asked, is the, does the book deal with predictive astrology, too, or just magical applications? It's predictive, too. There is a chapter on horoscopes, on natal, on, well, not just horoscopes. There's a whole chapter on natal astrology, which is reading your birth chart, nativities, as they're often called in trad astrology. And then there's a chapter on Horary astrology, which is divination and predictive astrology using the horoscope. Most people don't know this, but most horoscopes historically were not natal charts. Um, they were charts that were, ca- well, in European astrology, I should say. They were charts that were cast for divination. And it's an entire system in and of itself of divination that, is, that functions differently than normal chart reading, and it's explained in the Art Cosmic. So if you want to learn that as a divinatory practice, you can find it in the book. But yes, Jiva, it does deal with predictive astrology, not just magic astrology. So I'd have to say for the most part how I approach astrological or what I would actually say what I usually call it is planetary magic because from my periphery that's usually what I'm doing. Yeah. I've I've I have studied the zodiac in relation to the gods but I've never really gone there in my magic. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I've played with it in my mind. I've looked at different systems. I've tossed things around and I thought oh this is really a thing right. You know, I've gone down the rabbit hole, but I've never applied it. Whereas with the planetary magics, I've applied it. For me, I think that the real thing that I'm doing, other than the, you know, charts, you know, what your colors and metals are, 
is that I'm tapping into the archetypes of my gods through the archetypes of the planets. Exactly. Realizing there's this, a bit of a separation, but I, you know, as a witch, I, I do make that connection for myself and my work, mm -hmm. you know. Um, is that addressed in your book on some level? Like how these... It's so funny yeah. that you asked that because it's actually a caller, I mean, a commenter's oh, sorry. question. No, it's great because they're very similar and I can answer them yeah. both. So Susan asked, in Vedic astrology, which is, you know, Hindu astrology... Um, plant, or I should say it's, it's Indic, it's not necessarily Hindu, but it comes from India, how our planets are viewed as deities, right? Just like you're talking, you see the deity mm -hmm. through the planet, and the planets are sometimes propitiated as deity, right? And, and sort of for magic, right? Like you're seeing the god of, who rules Mars through Mars, which I think in Vedic astrology, Mars is Skanda or Murugan, you know, the god of war, the son of Shiva. Um, so she's saying, do you propitiate them in trad astrology? Yes. But I'm going to say this. Most of traditional astrology is European, which means, um, or Arabic, you know, or Jewish, which means that it is um, she monotheistic. She means leave offerings. Is that what yes. You mean? Oh. Or, or like, and I do not do that. Yeah. Or see the gods through them in general. I do that. Um, we do in trad astrology, but you would have to go pre-Christian if you wanted them to be pagan gods. In the vast majority of European astrology, it's Christianized. And so actually what we use are angels. There is a massive... That's, in the, that's what's in the magus. Yes. The astrological magic in the magus is angels. angelic. And yeah. the vast majority of European Christian codices on astrology are angelic. Yeah. So I have a whole chapter called Winged Stars, I think it's called. In Which most Yara people Cosmic don't realize that. that most of the spells in the Key of Solomon around those pinnacles are, from, are in the Bible. Yep, they're biblical the spells. So if you actually translate them and read them, it's passages from the Bible or passages from, uh, you know, the Torah. Mm-hmm. I think it's both, though. Isn't it's it? both. Yeah. There's Christian aspects in it too. The whole there's references to Holy Spirit and stuff. But I think that, um, but we use a lot of angelic names. I wonder what Tiki's sign is. What's Tiki? Tiki is a Capricorn. Tiki's a Capricorn. Yeah, just like Evil Daddy. Tiki's sun sign. See, we don't. Always, that's another <laughs> thing. And traditional. Don't know what his other ones sun are. Sun signs are not as important to us. Yeah. So I actually there's a there's a thing I say in the chart that I know people will be like, what? So okay, so like, I discovered a system that we talked about at one point in time that was popularized by um, Ptolemy of Alexandria, not Ptolemy the Pharaoh. At first I thought it was Ptolemy the Pharaoh, and, and Levi knew I thought that, but he broke it down for me. Because um, I was like, he knew he knew I thought that because I was way too excited. I know, because so you love the yeah, Alexandrian. Like, Ptolemy, you know. Um, but it, it's still named after him, still an Alexandrian, uh, a philosopher, whatever. Yes, he was. Um, but I loved the system, actually, so much so it's uh, recorded in my magical uh, journal that I have this, my magical grimoire, I have this system in place. Um, and that's where you actually have, like, multiple sun signs, multiple moon signs, and multiple rising signs. I think that's how it works. You've got three of each. The triplicity rulers. Yes. They're elemental. Do They're, you go over that? I go yeah. over the system of triplicity rulers. I don't use Ptolemy's system because it's it's the rarest one. He changed it. So Dorotheus of Sidon is who I follow. Yeah, the one I have has two versions. Yes. I liked his better because he mm -hmm. gave Mars uh, water and earth, which I thought for the actual Mars made more sense. Because if you were a god of war, yes. you would be associated with battle on the land and the sea. As well as his fertility Yes, Ptolemy changed, didn't change. Ptolemy has his own system of yeah. triplicity yeah. rulers, which is about the planets that rule um, elementally. Whereas modern astrology right. would give Mars fire. Only. Um, um, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense other than the color red. Classical gives it yeah. fire too, but yeah. the triplicities are about... I mean, the emotions. Yeah. So like, the triplicities are about elements. So it was saying that Mars and those two other planets, diurnal, Yeah, nocturnal. but it gave you yeah. three... I can't remember. You probably remember more than me, but it gave you three different ones, and it wasn't. It gives you the elements, but it also gives you, like, if you're born at a certain time, you're you get different planets wherever the sun is. Yeah, a diversity of planets versus just the one we get in. And yeah, they're called triplicity astrology. rulers, yeah. and they're in. So um, you're I, not just like like I'm a Taurus, and I'm still a Taurus in yes. his system, but I was also other things in my sun sign. That's it does how I'm remembering it. It influences yeah. them, absolutely. So Frank asked a okay. question. I do have a caller, but I want to take ask answer Frank's real quick. He says, do I discuss... Actually, I'm going to put the... I Just don't the, take these ones. Yeah, I will. Um, mm -hmm. I put it on the screen so everyone can see. The seven Olympian spirits. Um, the, the, there is an enormous don't take amount of, um, of... How do I word this? 
not necessarily pantheons, but groups of spirits that are associated with the seven traditional planets, and they are very long. I mean, if we were going to go into... that's in the Key of Solomon. Alone. Really, right? Or if the we Necronomicon, gonna, even. Like, the modern ones, yeah. yeah. If we were going to mm-hmm. go into, like, a Nokian magic, if we were going to go into, um, which is its own world... There's a hierarchy. It's, it's a huge hierarchy of spirits that is that You've is got that in paganism. So, Frank, mm-hmm. I did mention them. Um, but the ones that I tend to focus on are the god names that are associated with them, the archangels. There's a chapter on the archangels. Um, but I sort of stop there. I do tell you a little bit about sort of the Gnostic concept of the plurima, which is the, you know, the hierarchy of spirits or whatever. But I don't detail them because it is a book that I want people to find somewhat accessible. And some of the things on the Olympian spirits and the intelligences of the, sp- of the certain planets or whatever is, a, is more advanced. I give information that if you want to follow that information, you can. But I like to start with a strong central concept and then g- give people the room to breathe before we move on to something, you know, more in depth. All right, let's take some Ooh, callers. Not, not that one, though. I don't That's the only one. Well, what are these? Terminated calls. Oh, well, then just drop it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not taking those. Mm. Uh, so we will not be taking anonymous calls because it's just going to invite trolls. The trolls. So if your phone's anonymous, we're not going to take your call. Sorry, we want to be able to call you back in case, you're a, in case you're one of those people. In case you're one of those um, people. And we will. We will call you back. We'll find you. <laughs> no, we won't. Yeah, Lada Diana um, mentions Gnosticism. So, yeah, very important um, in... Astro- you know, it was a huge influence on a lot of um, astrological text. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I did is I, you know, in my little grimoire in the back of my book, I have just a small, I think it's one page, a planetary chart, which is uh, based on the Key of Solomon thing. But I corresponded what I was willing to share with the public on, like, for instance, like what I found. And this is a common Alexandrian practice in our coven. It's not anything secret. You know, how you can, sp- you know, correspond to Aphrodite, to mm-hmm. Venus, yep. to Hathor, perhaps to the Celtic Branwen, you know, whatever it is you're lining up. So in that sense, that, that does go on in, in the witchcraft mind, that we are looking at different versions of the powers that represent this energy, you know, Obviously, the Roman names govern them, and there's yes. a bit of a power in that. But as Levi's already said, you can probably actually find the Babylonian correspondences that yeah. that do. And I think I've got them written down somewhere, but I don't personally use them because I just don't gravitate to the Babylonian gods. Um, but yes, so in a sense, in a weird sense, we do. But when you go into the grimoires, it'll have angels and spirits that no one's even ever heard of. Yes, and you each know. grimoire will have... Because a lot yeah. of them are misspelled, and, and it was... It, you know, yeah. it's it's very complicated. And so I give a taste of it. I do... The ones I focus on the most in the book, and the reason I do... And I explain in the book, again, I'm not going to explain everything because I want you to read it. But I use the archangels because they are the most... If I had to pick one spirit in the European magical tradition, or spirits... I should say, that are continuously used for the seven planets. It's the archangels. And they are they have a consistency that I don't see in other spiritize, spiritizing systems for the planets. They're very consistent across Grimoire traditions. Gabriel's always the moon. You know, Sahiel or Sadkiel is always Jupiter. Like it's it's very rare that you find exceptions to this. And so that is the most consistent system, and it is the system I use. Although I do understand that not everybody loves angels. You know, because they really don't like that Abrahamic context. So I give other options as well. I, you know, I give to give an example from the book. I say, let's say you're working with Jupiter, magically or spiritually, and you really don't have any connection to Sahiel or Zadkiel or, or the angels, and you really don't want to do anything Christian. Well, work with Zeus. I mean, use oak leaves. You know, that was his oracle at Dodona in Greece. You know, he is Jupiter. You know, he is Zeus. So you can do that too. You so in your book, to. do you? Um, I know you did some rituals for each one. Are the rituals, what are the rituals focused on? Like, what are the primary archetypes you used in the rituals in your book? So some of them are Solomonic, some of them are folklore-inspired, and they all have, I wrote them the way that, like, traditional grimoires do. So there's, you know, when to do it and what it's for, you know, at the top of each one. So it'll say things like, um, you know, there's one that if you want to, for success at school, for Mercury or whatever, there's one for um, uh, lucid dreaming, you know, and messages and dreams from the moon. And and so I focused on what was used historically with planetary magic. So there are certain types of magic that were associated with certain planets, right? Necromancy for Saturn, um, dream work for the moon, love for Venus. You know, there are historical correspondences. Some surprising ones sometimes too, like land deals, Saturn, right? Um, 
you know, that's post Stephen. Yeah, they're interesting. All right, we're going to take a call from Stephen, I believe. Maybe. Hi, welcome to Covendom. Uh, hello, am I on? Yes, you are. Ah, uh, this isn't Stephen. This is Craig. Oh, hi, Craig. Um, yeah, look, I've uh, got a sort of a question and observation here. Uh, now, We're only welcoming was, uh, questions, that, uh... not observations. <laughs> only questions, <laughs> not observations. Uh, so when we invite callers okay. on, we question. Questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, because, and this is my fun thing, Craig, this is a show for our opinions because it's our show, not yours. <laughs> but please ask your question. Uh, he well, that. let's call it a question then. Sure. Okay, um, let me collect my thoughts a moment. Um, how do you see the uh, sort of powers of um, astrological magic, planetary magic, really, um, sort of, where, where do they spring from? I mean, you said that uh, it's a system for people on Earth and the universe they observe, hence no uh, sort of outer planets um, of the telescopic age and so forth. Yep. Uh, in that case, where, do, where does that power actually spring from? What's it in relation to? Um, well, historically, as far as we know, I ask, yeah. it's the Babylonians are the first yeah, well, recorded people that used them. But I think he's asking, like, what is the actual core of the power? And my answer is oh, going, God. it's God. I mean, God's, it's the divine. Yeah, yeah. I would argue the divine. I don't believe in um, secular astrology, is what I would say. And that is shared, I would say, by a lot of traditional yeah. astrologers that I read, Benjamin Dykes, John Frawley. There's a lot of traditional astrologers out there who will tell you they do not believe in a sort of... Um, a secularized form of astrology that it's inseparable from a belief in the sort of divine cosmic order. So I would say that it springs from the divine. Yeah. Okay. So um, how do you pr uh, practice it if you're on another planet? Um, if you're on another planet, um, that's a f actually here's a funny thing, and I will I actually like his question. Is this is I mean, I argue in the book astrology mm. is tied to the earth, and not only that, but traditional astrology is tied to Europe. Um, the systems that we use in traditional astrology do not work if you are born in certain places on this planet, and you will have to use different forms of astrology if you are outside of, you know, very, for, mm. very deeply southern or northern, you know, uh, latitudes. It doesn't work. And um, the, certain, the house systems and whatnot that we use. So if you were on another planet or if you're in extreme yeah. places, I would say you observe the heavens in that place because this is only for here and now. Right. It's, an, it's an archetype of it. You moment. know, if you're in Britain, you know, the reason why the oak, oak mm. tree or the hawthorn tree or, you know, the white thorn tree might be sacred is because they're actually where you are. You know, mm. you go to Africa and the hawthorn tree doesn't mean anything. And the planets are just a natural ob observation of people in their local uh, yeah. place. Yeah, so that's what I would say. Yeah, you know, um, an extension of that argument would be that um, uh, British traditional religion shouldn't be practiced anywhere except in Northwestern Europe because all the cultural associations are over there. <laughs> but, um, well, that's not really I true if you look at the history of America because we were once part of the British colonies. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for calling thank you in. Thank so much. Mm. <laughs> but no, his question is interesting because it's I always I actually say this in the book, which is this. Um, this is one practice, guys. It does not have to be a totality. So one of the things that gets people in trouble, I think, in any mm. magical system, not just astrology, is what you're talking about, which is where they try to stretch it so far beyond their own experience that it becomes useless. Like, well, I don't love that. Here's the whole thing that I can give you, you know, because obviously I play, you know, I play with different uh, typesets of magic as well. I think a lot of occultists do, obviously. Of course. And, but, you know, at the heart of it, I'm a witch, you know, and that's going to be my guiding star about how I think and what my philosophies are mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So, you know, there is this point in which the logical mind can become a cage, just as much as there's a point into where the spiritual mind can become a delusion, right? Yeah. So I think a lot of times people who approach some of these Western occult systems of astrology or the Kabbalah or whatever, they, they approach it in a very analytical, pseudo-scientific mindset. You know, some people try to do that with the craft, but they do that, and it it's kind of is a magic killer. You know, Maxine says, and I agree with her, that academia is a magic killer, not of itself, but the approach, Right. So one of the things I love about traditional astrology is, or planetary magic, is the fact that it's approaching it from the sacred. Always. 
how did you balance your work in, in this book with approaching it with the sacred and still retaining yourself as an academic? I'll say this. Um, it was hard, but I, I very much made the point over and over again in the book, and I hope that readers take it to heart if they're going to practice astrology in any form, which is, this is meaningless without the magic, guys. <laughs> like, a four-year-old a five-year-old could disprove some of the things that modern astrology says that they try to say is science. It's not. Like when people tweet things like, well, we're mostly made of water and the planets pull on us. That's not true. That's not how gravity works. You know, anybody who's had science beyond middle school should know this. It's just not true. So if you rip the sacred out of it and you solely want it to be cause and effect, in my opinion, it is a butterfly collection. It can be as pretty as you want, but it is dead. You know, it, it's gorgeous, and it's very, like, beautifully outlined, but it is dead, okay? Stephen is calling. He made sure to let You're us know. You're hitting anonymous. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, because he let us know. I'm trying to... I followed the rules. This doesn't work very well, does it? <laughs> I think it... Did it not? I'm so sorry. No, it's really sad, this program. Okay. Welcome Hello. to Coven Dumb. Hi, Stephen. <clears throat> Oh, hello. How's it going? It's going well. How are you? Good, good. So firstly, congratulations on the book. Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to reading it. Um, so, Stephen, did um, you know, Australia? Did questions. you? I have a question for you first. <laughs> I'm having a oh, bit of a question. For me? <laughs> did you realise that Australia was once part of the British Empire? Oh, of course, absolutely. <laughs> Did I'm a, you I'm a realize monarchist. that America was once a part of the British Empire? <laughs> yes. Brian is Did having a bit of fun. Did you know that America was founded by British people? Did you know that? Oh, okay. Of course. Just wanted to know if general education yeah. had made its way into Australia. <laughs> All right, thank you. So um, mean. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, anyway, for your questions. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, my first question, um, so uh, I guess, uh, so I'm not sure exactly what's in your book in detail, but I wanted to just ask um, Levi's opinion and also Brian's opinion about uh, not just the planets, but other aspects of astrological magic. So in particular, the decans, yes. um, uh, because um, I know that they, um, for example, in um, Paul Hewson's book, he uses the decans as a means of um, summoning Visago, for example. So yes, what are your thoughts about the decans and their uses in astrological magic? They are explained, we do address them in the art cosmic. They're part of what I put under in one of a lot of other traditional astrologies called dignities and debilities, which are the locations of the planets and the heavens and whether or not they have dignity, meaning they're in a place they want to be and they function well, or whether they have mm -hmm. debility, which is when they're in a place where they do not. The deacons are a little bit more fascinating um, in a way because Brian, will, Brian would love to study the deacons, I think, because they are, a lot of people believe, this is not totally corrob you know, corroborated academically, but a lot of people believe they are based on Egyptian star clocks, right? That they broke the year mm -hmm. down by the rising and falling Makes of certain... Makes you think I haven't studied constellations and stars. <laughs> you said you didn't. You only did planetary magic, not starry uh, magic. I told you I've gone through the rabbit hole. I've never applied it. Okay, okay. Different. But the deacons, yeah. the deacons, I do use them, but I use them for, in predictive astrology and in um, magical astrology as basically either a dignity or a debility for the planet. I give the planet a, a certain extra dignity if it is in, turn, in face, which means it's in the correct deacon, right? And if you're watching yeah, and yeah, you don't okay. know what a deacon is, it's... Um, the deacons in the zodiac are that all zodiac signs are broken into 10 degree portions. That's why they use the word deacons from the word mm -hmm. for 10. Um, and those deacons are given rulerships by certain planets. So if Venus is in the deacon yeah. of Venus, then it has more dignity than if it was in the deacon of a planet that it does not, that does not correspond. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you okay. know anything about the craft, you know, we believe in reincarnation and it's not an ethnic faith, but you know, uh, it is. It, it does come from Britain, not Australia or America. You're right about that. So anyway, yeah. um, uh, to your question, I definitely don't put that into my magic. Like I have studied the the zodiac in the sense that I've loved comparing the ideas of the archetypes of Sagittarius. Is that in a sense, you know, speaking of the Huntress Diana, or yeah. you know. Um, you know, these different things like that that I've explored for myself. 
Um, but I don't really apply it to my magics. I think sometimes... Well, well, in the realm of the armchair sorcerer or the ceremonial magician, in truth, sometimes these complicated systems serve their minds. I don't really find them very beneficial to my... Uh, my ability to create change. I don't need that kind of complexity, so I don't tend to apply it. I have explored it. It a bit reminds me of the Abramelin in the sense how you have the, you know, you have to have like the one spirit being the sub and one spirit being the active of the the same planet and you're going to use them for different things. It's just another version of taking this energy and giving it a nod in a different direction you know, with witches, mm -hmm. we do that with the waxing and the waning moon. Yes. It's still the moon. They're just aspects of it and how it's traveling or how we're perceiving it, which is more correctly, that we decide it, influence our magic in a certain way because it's sympathetic magic. Only really mm -hmm. trained, uh, enlightened people in the early ancient world would have been able to track such things. They did exist. We know they existed. They built monuments around it, you know. So, it, yeah, yeah. It, it did happen, and it can happen now, and if that's your way, fine. But, yeah, my magic in planetary magic really doesn't go that far. You know, yeah. I'm a witch, you sure. know. And it's, it's uh, I play with the Key of Solomon. I play with the symbols and the archetypes and the colors and the metals, and that's all there for me. Great, dandy. Yeah. But, you know, no, I'm not, no. I'm never going to write a book of astrology. <laughs> I had a little <laughs> correspondence that I shared with you all in my book. Fair. No, no. Fair. <laughs> Did you have another question, Stephen? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, so my next question, um, I guess um, it's probably, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how relevant this would be to your practice, to, to, to both of you and your practice of witchcraft, but for example, um, regarding you know, astrological talismans or even, uh, even planetary talismans, mm -hmm. um, would you... Would you like do um you know a horary chart or like on the computer or on a program to look at where the planets are or would you instead go out and look at the night sky and see where the star is or the planet is in the night sky? If I was going to you do know, it, like physically I would look use at it the or would computer, you? Or I would call Levi or Carrie or Ellie. <laughs> you know that's what I would do. You know um, because yeah. I'm not an astrologist. But and I will tell you yeah. some of those computer programs are very accurate and yes. I had my chart done by Carrie, a member of our coven, and Christian told me about this computer program. He's like, this is really good. You should check this. You should compare it to this. And when I did, the computer program verified everything Carrie said, which basically means Carrie's a computer. Valid. From other planets, mm -hmm. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go um, ahead. If I, so to answer the question from my perspective... Um, uh, Stephen, if I was going to do planetary, if I'm doing astrologically guided magic, I am going to cast a chart. So um, I'm not going to create a talisman yeah. for communication magic or speed magic if Mercury is heavily debilitated in the hour that I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I would yeah. not do that yeah. personally. <clears throat> so if I, cause, because I think you have to honor whatever you're tapping into. So if I'm trying to tap into the egregore and the spirit of astrological magic, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to take that into consideration, right? Um, I don't do that in mm -hmm. craft. Um, I, I, craft has its own magical systems that are for initiates, right? But if I was going to do it as an astrologer, as a planetary magician, yes, I would definitely use a chart. As a descendant of the goddess Aphrodite, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that she exists in the sea and the land and the mineral of copper and that that planet rolling in the sky is an altar to her. But what this comes to is the fact that people just started noticing those things. So, Levi, a yeah. question for you. Well, we've got the, the Australian, the good Australian on the phone. Um, I do love Australian accents. Craig, I even love Durex. I'm a <laughs> sucker for Australian accents. I love them. doesn't matter what you say. I'm like, oh. Um, there's something about them. They're like <laughs> British accents with like an edge. You know? <laughs> um, how did you, like, okay. When I wrote my book, Initiation to Witchcraft, I found like... It was like an initiation writing the book. Yes. How did writing this book change your practice? I look at the stars mm. a lot more. Good question. I know that's a silly thing to say, but um, I look at the stars a lot more. Um, I care more about larger things. I actually got really like, 
into weird politics and, and like big concepts, global concepts, you know what I mean? So like it made me more cosmic, I guess. I mean, that is the sort of purpose of it. So that would be what it did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> made mm. me more of a stargazer. I agree. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Stephen. Did you have any other questions before we let you go? It was lovely to hear from you. Uh, yes, I I have one more question. So um, uh, I'll keep it brief. So sorry. Um, so my question. We're not going is, anywhere. Uh, so, <laughs> You're uh, fine. Uh, sorry. We're not, said, we're not going anywhere. You're uh, fine. Uh, oh, cool, cool. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, my final question is. Um, I guess it's it's something that. Um, I've noticed, well, because I'm heavily into astrological magic, so, um, yeah, um, I've noticed something that, uh, I've noticed that as I've sort of gone more into it, I will sometimes just at some random time get a, get a feeling of, to, to make a talisman or to do some type of astrological magic, and then when I've actually done a chart, it sort of corresponds to what I had felt internally. Mm -hmm. So my question goes to, um, I guess to uh, Levi or even to to Brian, I'm um, in planetary sort of magic. But have you found that um, when a time comes for you to do a working, that you're sort of already connected to that divinity that underlies the astrology, where it's almost like you can make a talisman and automatically the stars are aligned to that. It can be. I think the the best way to answer that is to say that the more you practice, the more you will naturally become used to the cycles. So you will naturally fall into understanding how the you know what the lunar cycle is like, or even the when Venus is mm. visible on the horizon and when she's not, um, when Mars is particularly red in the night sky and when he's not. Um, mm. I think that you will naturally start to imbibe that cyclical view of things, and it will become almost second nature. It is yes. It is, yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, wow. Fascinating. Okay. I cannot wait to read the book. I will put my order in ASAP. Oh, thank you. I'm super excited. Cool, cool. Have a wonderful All rest right. of your day. You too, guys. Have a lovely night. Bye. Bye-bye. It would be great to be entertained just sitting and looking at people. I know. The like, dog he's just literally like, brutal. this is great. We're just like, <coughs> oh, you're going to start the growling thing, are you? But he's kissing too. It's love and hate, children. I don't know. I don't know what his thing is. Why he growls? Is it, is it Levi? Is it me? No, I don't think so. No, you don't want to be held. So we up. do have another caller. I'm going to take. Maybe it's the light. Maybe. Mm. Hi, welcome to Covendom. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, it's Alexander. Um, I have a couple of questions for you guys. Sure. So, um, planetary magic is kind of like the first magic that a lot of beginners learn how to do. Uh huh. And I remember when I first read a ritual published by an Alexandrian, it was a ritual to Queen Hagio. I think that's how you say her name. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. Prob you probably know what I'm talking about from Stuart Farrar's book. Uh, I think, it, yes, it's what witches do. Stuart Farrar was the, the writer uh, hired to pin the work. He was, he was doing, the, at the time he wrote that book, he was not an Alexandrian. He was actually just writing the book for Alex and Maxine Sanders. Um, he became Alexandrian through the process of writing that book. But it's what witches do. And yes, I am familiar with the, the, mm -hmm. it. It's published, but yes, yep. I'm familiar with it. So I didn't know that. My question for um, Levi is, will your book kind of be, um, well, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the philosophy behind it? Uh, will you be approaching it as a, as a witch or as primarily an astrologer? Because I know the, um, that most of the rites that were in that book or most of the philosophy that was in that book centered around um, the god and goddess of witchcraft and then as in a planetary situation, kind of like how um, Patricia's rites at the end of her book, Let Off the Cauldron. Will your book yep. be situated kind of like that? Um, the book does not make a lot of mention of initiatory craft. Um, I did that on purpose. Um, but my, my comment would be, I'm always a witch. I'm always a priest. Um, I do not believe in compartmentalizing your religion. I know that's very popular right now because of this argument that witchcraft, I'm not saying you're saying this, of course, but it's very popular for some people to say that witchcraft is just an orthopraxy, that you can do 
um, initiatory witchcraft on Wednesdays. My favourite line, I don't care if he's killing bunnies as long as he's not in a gardenarian circle. Exactly, right? Like, I don't... Right. I don't That's the philosophy we don't mesh with. I don't really view it yeah. as orthopraxic. I view it as religious. So I'm always a witch. But I would argue that viewing the, the cosmos as divine um, and viewing the night sky as populated with lights that belong to divinity and therefore can influence our lives and we can use them in magic does not contradict my craft in any way. So I don't feel the need to witch it up if that, if that, you know, in any way, nor do I feel the need to witch it down because to me, there's no contradiction. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Welcome. My question was like really beef. No, it's a good no, question. It's fine. Did you have any other questions? Um, no. Thank you, thank and you so congratulations on your book, Levi. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Okay, so we have one more. I'm going to take it as well. We have a queue. We just have drop fancy. call. Did I? Oh, my yes, God. I'm so did. sorry. If I just hung up on you, please call back. Uh, Levi just hung up on I someone. Did. It's new. It's I told the first you time it I did is it. his fault. Nine Brian times thinks everything. Time. While they're calling back, I'm going to answer Frank's question. He said, you work with planetary inter- entities in your book's rituals. Do I approach them as a magician or a witch? Both. Both. Um, I'm always a witch, so there's nothing I do in my I life. I haven't seen the rituals, all of them yet, yeah. so I don't have an opinion about it, obviously. But I do not um, approach anything in my life, is what I'm going to say, not as yeah. a witch. Yeah, okay, you can look at Patricia Crowther's rituals. Obviously, she did sort of push the craft more into her rituals, but here's the thing you have to understand. She was trying to give you the flavor of the craft, mm-hmm. but she was in a very educational time. You know, now we've got so many books on the craft that trying to teach people craft through planetary magic would be asinine now, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to compare the two. But like Levi and I are saying, or the Alexandrians, how we are as Alexandrians, I keep looking at that again. How we are as Alexandrians is, yes, when I'm performing my, when I'm performing any magic, I am an Alexandrian priest. Same. I'm a witch. So... That is the lens I look at the entire world through. I don't have different lenses for different things. But, you know, if I were to write a book on the Kabbalah, unless I was going to do it from the periphery as a witch, it's going to be on the Kabbalah, you know, exactly. and my experiences with it. And try not to push that, you know, my personal things in the, in the educational process. So I think this, this book is... Yes, it's from the perspective of a witchcraft high priest, but it's actually a book on, you know, traditional astrology, Absolutely. astrology and magic. But there's nothing so, I do that's not yeah. as a witch. Yes. So I would never write a book there's that... Nothing, there's nothing contrary. And you know exactly. what, honestly, there's nothing contrary about planetary magic and craft anyway. I wouldn't have written <laughs> anything, though. I've never read did. any planetary magic that was, like, contrary. But there's no way I would you write know? a book, for example. Like, I, I don't agree with the orthopraxic movement, to redefine witchcraft as something that doesn't have serious beliefs or that you can step outside of, that's not my view. So there's nothing I could... I would never write a book that advocated practices that were contrary or absolutely forbidden or whatever in the tradition. That would be foolish to me. Okay, first of all, Stephen, drop the word bro. <laughs> I love everything about you except that one thing. Don't ever use that word again. <laughs> so hateful tonight. I'm going to... It's not hateful. It's good advice. It is good advice, actually. I hate that word. Welcome to Covenant. <laughs> I also don't like it when strangers Hi. call me brother. Hi, who's this? Hi. Hi, it's Micah. Um, I've Hi. been watching you guys for a while. I was curious. Um... Levi hung up I on you. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> I touched Le- Levi nothing. hung up on you. I did not. I, we lost the call, so you'll have to call back. I'm sorry. Don't know what happened. I did not touch a thing. I think he hung up on us. I think it was... Oh. Mm-mm. Did we lose internet? Yeah, we'll have to recall in. How do you know how to do that? Not during. Okay. So if anyone's watching who might be able to help us with this, we've lost our phone. <laughs> Here at the house. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I cut you off. You can p- please put your comment in the questions. Oh, is it back now? The questions in the comment. I am very sorry. Um, Are we back on? No. Okay, so host call in. We would have to call from our phone on here, right? Um, it just logged us out. So the next time, if yeah, we have to call back in. Well, yeah, but we've, we're really early in the show. We've got to be able to take calls. What time is it? 
Eight fourteen. Yeah, we've got like an hour left. So, um, okay, host call in, or yes, if somebody could help <laughs> us with this, we'll we'll take calls again. But I don't know. Um, but until then, please put things in the message. There is a host in you. call in press button, or and then there's a pin. I'm sure, you can't do it from here. Host call in. I can try on my phone. Three four four eight. So sorry, guys. Thanks technical difficulties. One the... second. Oh, I think he's trying to tell you how to do it. I'm calling. No, I think he's trying to tell you how to do it. Did he message you, maybe? Mm -mm. I'm calling right now. One second. Or maybe he told you to call him. He's calling you. No, I'm calling the right number. The thing's going here. Showed you how to do this, and it really doesn't matter because no one listens to me anyway. I'm doing it. No, it's not from there. No one listens to me ever. This is what we deal with. Yeah, it's called No One Ever Listens to Me. I always tell the truth, and I'm always right. One second. So. Uh, all right, you call the number, then you do the host pin. It's. Right there, 3448. 818-794. Our host pen is right here, 916. Yeah. See, it was Levi's fault. Thank you for calling Colin Studios host and call screener line. Please enter your show number and press pound. That was an invalid show number. Please re-enter your show number, followed show by the pound key. This is not difficult. That was an invalid show number. Please re enter your show number, followed by the pound key. 3448. No, he's typing in the right number and it's not working. We did not receive a response. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah, I did the same thing. Because I think you're in the screen call and I don't know why. I, don't know. I called the number. Well, what's it saying? Actually, it was saying that the show number was invalid. Like it did with you earlier. I don't know why it disconnected. Well, we just may not be able to take calls the rest of the night. Yeah, I that's don't okay. Know. We'll just have them call the other number. I just don't remember what it is. We just may not take I was calls. on for three hours and this didn't go off, so I don't know what happened. It literally went off on its own. We weren't touching anything. But this is now part of our show, so I'd rather just not take calls than go on in this I'll try one more time, and if not, we won't take them. All right. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you for calling Colin Studios host and call screener line. Please enter your show number and press pound. Then the pound. That was an invalid no, show please number. Please, please re-enter your show number, followed by the pound key. It's okay, we'll reset it. Well, time. guys, we're not going to be able to take any more phone calls tonight. But we'll we did go not receive and, a response. Uh, we can have Goodbye. questions on the chat, so that's where we are. Don't know. Every time we move locations, we've got technical difficulties. And this uh, is a new technology, so no idea why it dropped. Okay, let me try. We're going to try it one more time, We're going to try one more time. <laughs> Capricorns don't know how to quit. You also know how to listen. Well, he was doing it right. Because they did it for you earlier, remember? It didn't. Yeah, but that was different because you called no, This is a part of my show system. right now. Exactly. Right. We're just not going to take phone calls for the rest of the night. We're fine. So, yes. Uh, anyway, um, don't know why it's not working and don't want to deal with it. So, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and we'll go ahead and answer them. So, what was the... Well, we don't even know what the last guy's question was. <laughs> no. So go ahead and uh, type it in if you want to ask the question. Otherwise, we'll go on from here. So don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna thing. Go back to a couple of them. We used to not be a call-in show either, so we'll live. <laughs> so, um, yes. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going back, guys. Sorry about that. So people are asking, mm -hmm. bringing it back to what we were talking about, Going beyond planets to things like stars, the suns, stuff like that. Um, yes, uh, the book has an entire chapter on the fixed stars. 
uh, we do use stars in magic. We don't view the sun as a star, though, in traditional astrology. The sun and the moon are luminaries, but they're also considered one of the seven classical planets, right? Because the word planet actually comes from the Greek word for, um, comes from planet is asteris, which means like wandering stars, right? Because they're the stars that move in the sky. <clears throat> so the sun and the moon are used, even though they're not necessarily planets, and the fixed stars are too, which are the stars that are not part of, uh, you know, they're not planets, they're the actual stars in the heavens. We use both of them in magic. And I will say they have a very different feel if you've worked for both, if you've worked with both. So if you've tried planetary magic and then also did something with the fixed stars or the constellations, you will see that they're different. Um, and I go into detail on that in the book, and you can read about it. What does a cow mean? What? Well, there was a question here, didn't a cow move away? I don't know what it means. I thought maybe it was a planetary thing. Like, well, I've lost it now sitting there. Didn't a, a cow move around? I, I thought maybe it was an astrological hmm. thing. I didn't know. Anyway. I didn't see it. So type in your questions. We don't have a phone. Uh, let me see. Do I have any other questions? Um, okay. So in your training, because I don't think that there's anything oath-bound about this as an Alexandrian, you know, you were exposed to planetary magic and um, angelics, which are oh, partially planetary. Right. Yeah. Um, what uh, was that a catalyst for you? A catalyst for you at all in the work that you proceeded to do with the art cosmic? Yes. So in the tradition, we do have contacts with that. Um, it's definitely a part of it because you know one of the things that I love about Alexander and Craft is you're sort of free to explore all these different areas of the occult and all these are different areas of magic and they're all sort of used respected maxine calls it a scavenger religion right we take what works etc cetera, etc cetera. so um i like that um and what i was exposed to in craft definitely was part of exploring that moving forward with that thinking that it was um important or maybe something that i should investigate further it helps absolutely and like brian said there's nothing in it that's contradictory to craft right no, there's not. And most magical systems in the West aren't. You know, the craft is a religion, so we have ethics, you know, and so sometimes that might create a barrier. But most magical systems don't have ethics. Most magical systems are just magical systems. It's the person practicing them that has to apply the ethics. You know, because most of them aren't approached as a religion. So that's Yeah, they're not approached as a religion. And astrology is never approached as a religion. Not in our modern age. In no. any age. Yeah. Astrology was, was open to practitioners of various faiths. You have Christian astrologers who are very important in history, like William Lilly. You have Jewish you know, well, I think astrologers. I the origins like, of it were religious. Yeah, you have Jewish yeah. astrologers. I think in Babylon Muslim was, astrologers. In like, Babylon, you'd have to agree it was approached probably oh, always as religious. religious. But you could practice, it transcends any particular religion. You're not, today's yeah, age. Yeah. yeah, you're not stuck yeah. in one particular way of yeah. viewing God in astrology. There's always a sort of divine or spiritual background to it, but you're not stuck in one system. What right? we probably had in the past was certain castes of priesthoods who had the knowledge from observing the stars that they had created these, these egregores around them. It's amazing. You know, it shows you why we, you know, why don't we accomplish those things today? Because we're watching TV and we're on the computer. People didn't have anything to do. They were looking at the stars. They were philosophizing. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I think that, you know, beyond the computer age, we really haven't accomplished much in, in the sense that we don't observe so much going on around us. You know, and I think that's the true lesson of astrology is there were really, these people were observing, not only what was going on around them, but what was going around them in the heavens. You know, this came from people observing with the naked eye, as Levi saying. Yes. You know, and the luminaries, the seven luminaries, the sun, the moon, and the five planets we can see. And track. In the heavens, you know. Um, so, Stephen asked a very good question, which is, what are your opinion about the fixed Bahanian stars? So, if you don't know, Bahanian stars are a group of 15 stars that were historically used in magic. Um, there are a lot of references to them in Agrippa and, and people who were inspired by Agrippa. Um, they come from an Arabic word, you know, Bahman. But they are a group of stars, fixed stars, so they're not planets. They're stars like Spica, which is a, you know, um, a star in the constellation Virgo, um, that are used in magic. They're particularly used for the creation of magical talismans. Uh, you know, this is very popular in the work of people like Christopher Warnock, you know, a traditional astrologer who works with Renaissance-based astrology. But um, yes, they are talked about in the book. So in the Art Cosmic, you will learn about the fixed stars and you will learn about magic that uses the, the stars that are 
not moving across the night sky, but that are part of the constellations we've all known since our childhood. You know, it's this night sky that we look up into and what magic is One of my favorite them. memories was, you know, we learn when we're younger, you know, somebody will show us the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper. Yeah. Or you might get to see Venus. You know, there's certain things that you're shown by certain people. Orion's Belt. I think most of us have been able to be introduced to that. But I was with a friend of mine who was really into the stars and that sort of thing, and I could never see anything, you know. And she had found Pegasus, and mm-hmm. she kept trying. We were just laying on our back looking at the stars, and she kept trying to point it out to me. She kept trying to point it out to me. And then all of a sudden, I saw the whole thing, and it was like something off TV where all the stars connect. Yeah, it's very beautiful. And it came alive for me. I've never been able to find it, find it again, but I did get to see Pegasus once, and it was... It was like that. Once you see it, it pops out. Absolutely. You know. Um, so, Lada Diana mentioned something that's super important um, for understanding astrology, and I'm so glad you brought this up, which is, she says, thoughts on when you see news stories or whatever about the 13th sign of Lucas, oh, right? Yes. The serpent bearer or the serpent, whatever. Um, this is based on a misinterpretation of how astrology works, that, that every now and then, and it happens every, like, three years, it seems, some scientific magazine will publish this gotcha to the to us superstitious astrologers by pretending that we don't understand something that's called axial tilt, which is the planet wobbles on its axis, and therefore the constellations no longer correspond directly to the time frames that are given to them for the zodiac. What I mean by that is, if you are a Taurus, like Brian, then actually the sun was not, there's a good chance it was not in front of the stars that make up the constellation Taurus. Sun. Right? You've said you were a Taurus before, but um, the sun was, might not have been in front of that group of stars. But here's the thing that these people don't understand, is in traditional astrology, the constellations are not actually what we use anymore to demarcate the signs. It's time. And ancient astrologers actually did know about axial tilt. Ptolemy knew about it, and he writes about it. They didn't oh, call the it that, things but they, they knew, knew about, about it. I mean... Yeah, they knew about it. I think we, we, you know, we don't generally as a people realized that there were people in ancient Greece who were more educated than the common person walking around today. You know, there were people in, there were philosophers in ancient Greece who knew more about the planets, yeah. astronomy and science than your average American. You know, and that sounds ridiculous, but I think it's kind of true, you know, because, well, they really put their heads to it. You know, we are stuck in these worlds of illusions all the time. And yeah. beyond our the academic um, obstacle course we're forced to go through, most of us don't continue pursuing some of those sciences and things. And hell, you've got people on this uh, country who still think the planet's flat. I know, right? A, a large movement. number of a people growing movement. who actually believe the planet's flat, and it's all a conspiracy theory that I it's know. round. You know, so. Weird. But yes, it is. You know. We base the we base in traditional Western astrology. We base um, the signs of the zodiac around time and our experience here on Earth. It is tr- true that they used to be named after constellations, and we still use those names, but they are not associated with that anymore. Now, there is an entire group of astrologers that do do this. They rectify the um, the system so that it fix fits with the constellations. These this is called sidereal astrology, and the word sidereal means star based. But the type of astrology I pay, I practice is, I would say, Earth-based. It's geocentric, right? The way the ancients experienced life. Not because we are denying science and saying that the sun is not the center of the, you know, the solar system. We're not you know, ignorant of science. What we're saying is, is our experience is Earth-based. You don't live on the sun, right? You live here. And so what the world looks like and how you experience it and how the, ye- how the year turns is important. So you can't just say, well, science says it's here. Well, yes, but what are you experiencing? It's important to know both, right? To be scientifically literate, but also in touch with how, where you live and why you do I what you do. I had a similar conversation on the witchcraft scale, you know, and I do have a question for you, but I had a similar experience on the witchcraft scale. I was discussing the moon, right? Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to come out and, like, it was a public conversation. It wasn't, a, it wasn't me teaching. It was just a blanket statement, kind of throwaway comment, and it was about the witching hour, yeah. And it was about the fact that the witching hour is associated with midnight. And that, mm-hmm. you know, um, that the moon, you know, is, is associated with midnight. I didn't get into the details, but I had all these people coming at me with, oh, you really just don't know how the moon really works, basically. Yeah. Right? And it's like, of course I do. 
You know, I think it's uh, the the summer solstice. I think it is is when the moon. I think it's the summer solstice, or is it the winter solstice? One of the solstices, the moon is exactly overhead at midnight, and every full moon of the year, you know, it's overhead at midnight. But as you get further away, it's not midnight except on the full moon, right? But I, the way I made the statement was in a magical way. It wasn't in a. I wasn't trying to describe the orbit of the moon. I was trying to describe the fact that the association with witches and the witching hour of twelve midnight was an association of the moon. Totally lost in the concept. I think the same thing happens with with what these modern astrologists are doing, or you know, people who are trying to debunk is the technicalities, and we get that in magic all the time. You know, like witchcraft mm-hmm. will say it's the oldest religion in the world. And people will come out with, well, you know, it was created in the 1950s by Joel Garner. They're missing the point. They're missing the spiritual truth. They're missing the point, right? So I think that that's, you know, I haven't read the book cover to cover, but what I have read has been really good. I'm on page, you know, it it really co- uh, aligns with my belief about planetary magic. But I do have a question for you since I haven't read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Is this book written so that the common occultist can understand it or did you go above everyone's head? <laughs> To show your Good academic question. Um, it is written for everyone. Um, yeah. It is written for someone who's very interested in astrology, though. And it's written for someone who either has no experience in astrology, so we start with the, what, what are the planets and what do we use them as, or it's also written for what I think is the largest group of people, which is you know a little bit about astrology. You know your sign. You might know your rising sign. You might know where your moon is. You might even know certain correspondences, like Jupiter's about kingship or Mars is for war and Venus for love and the moon for mothers and fertility or whatever. So those are things that a lot of people know, but they want to know more. And I'm teaching the astrology to you from the the bones. You'll you'll know all about like you know what the planets are, how to build a chart, what it looks like, what a horoscope is. But I am trying to show it to you from that perspective of how it was viewed before the modern world, which goes to actually a question from Katie, Katie McLaughlin, I think, from McLaughlin. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. What would I say caused slash created modern or new astrology? Um, a couple things. The biggest one being. Um, I love how Christian's just ranting about his experience <laughs> on our show. I would say the biggest this one This is why we be... don't have the show here, Christian. <laughs> I would say the biggest one would be um, the Enlightenment. You know, yeah. the Enlightenment is what created that. Um, people sort of sucked the, the Neoplatonic system out. They sort of sucked away a lot of um, the magic out of certain systems. Belief was no longer popular. Um, you know, it was a defiance against the church. And then people within the magical community wanted to, in a way gain traction with that movement. So they tried to make astrology scientific. So they tried to make, okay, we're not going to be geocentric anymore. We're not going to, we're going to, we're going to prove that it's a science. A lot of magic did this. Spiritualism did this. And they're still trying to do it. It's one of your favorite things. You know, it's like, it's people who are really trying to make (laughs) um, psychical research and things like that. They're really trying to make astrology a science, whereas historically it was an art. You know, that's why I called the book the art cosmic, why it's called the art magical. Like it's an art, right? It's not, um, not strictly a cause and effect science and so trying to view astrology through that lens created a system where they had to take into effect the outer planets they had to take into effect the fact that the sun was the center of the solar system because now we know seem... more yeah exactly now we know and i actually this is a bit off subject you know in the sense that but it's true it's one of my pet peeves people being apologetic for, for magic, or people being apologetic for, for the way that the occult is, or even the way witchcraft is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I have to, like, backtrack and explain that I'm not uh, an ignorant savage living in a cave poking at a fire. Yeah. You know, I've got to prove to everyone that I'm actually well-read and well-versed and I'm not actually superstitious. And I'm, It's a very Western occult and particularly British thing to show how astute and intelligent you are in spite of the fact that you believe in these kooky things, you know? And it's like, honestly, like, why bother? You know, believe what you're going to believe, embrace it fully, and articulate the reasons why. Don't be apologetic about it. And I think that that's what's happened with a lot of systems of magic, and it always makes them boring, and it always makes them ineffective when we go down that road. You know, it just does, you know. So you've got to make it your own, you know. So with Planetary Magic, you know, Levi's book or anyone else's book, I would say, if 
you're drawn to it, which I suspect if you're watching this program you might be, then read all you can on it. Read Levi's book, read Patricia Crowther's book, Lit Off the Cauldron, read her other book whose name yeah. I already can't remember. What is it called? <laughs> um, the subtitle was Initiation Journey Through I the think Twelve it Signs. Might have had another name at one point, Journey but I don't know for signs. sure. Um, read every book you can and then find your own way. And if you can't find your own way, or if somebody doesn't present a way that works for you, then it's just not a system for you. You know, and that happens. So, but yes, astrological planetary magic is one of the systems I think that survived because of its academic connection to science. It's, yeah, like alchemy you know, and chemistry. And I that, think yeah. that that's part of the reason why we have it. So we should be grateful for that, that side of it. You know, is that you had people, I was just, can't think of the book, but a lot of old herbal um, medical books, like books by the doctors of the time, would, dis would ascribe your med prescribe your medicine based on your zodiac sign. Yes, hardcore. Like, they were big into that. super crazy. Yes, but you know, oh, you're a Taurus? You need this for whatever's ailing you. Yes. Um, but that's part of the reason why it survived, is that there is a crossover between magic and science. Um, time. And it, medical astrology, I did not do medical astrology in the book because I have whole thoughts about that, and I don't think... And but, we don't want to get sued. <laughs> yeah, valid. <laughs> but um, it, is, it is a huge part. Uh, you know, when I talked earlier about us having these massive records from you know, Mesopotamia about astrology in the Babylonian and Sumerian worlds, the majority of the cases of, of charts are for medical reasons. And then you have, you know, millennia later, you have the same thing happening in treatises on European astrology where they're writing about which part of the liver certain <clears throat> stars affect. You know what I mean? So it is a, it is definitely a part of... Um, Unfortunately, yeah. right now, our, if, if, you've called, if you've just come in, our phones aren't working currently. So we have a new phone program. It died on us. And instead of stopping the program and trying to fix it, we're going on without it. Because the program's live. We're That's live. Because it's live. I wanted to go back and answer, and um, we did answer this a minute ago, but somebody did ask, you know, is it beginner friendly? Yes, Brian asked that, but I want to be Well, very, I mean, yeah. as, as his high priest, friend, and publisher, I was a bit worried about that, you know. Um, you know, but uh, Levi's really connected to the work, so I, from what I have read, it is something that the layman could understand, but it could be a bridge for more advanced working students. That's too. what I really wanted. Because he's giving you the resources or the people you can go to if you wanted to explore, you know, those deeper things. Yeah. Or and not deeper necessarily, but, you know, more archaic, maybe. And yeah. it's also, um, you know, some of them are, are more, you're going to be drawn to certain things in any magical practice. Like if you're an herbalist, it doesn't mean that every single thing about herbalism is going to be your favorite thing. You know, there's going to be something that really speaks to you that you work on. Um, the same is true of astrology. You know, if you are really, really into planetary magic, then you'll love this book. If you really want to learn how to do horary, there is a chapter on horary that will teach you how to use... What is horary? It's divination by astrology. It's a horrible name. I've <laughs> never heard of that before. It's a... Yeah, horary astrology. Um, I call that the newspaper. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> not horoscopes. <laughs> horary is not about birth. <laughs> Okay. So it's like it's like tarot or any other form of divination. So how horary Do you works. do horary on your phone? I've done it before for people. On your phone? You can. Is that how you do it? Uh, no. How do you do it? I usually have a question in mind and kind of ritualize it a little before I cast the chart. So either I, I will use a He'll have to explain though. this to me. It sounds... Yeah. Or I'm going to do horary for you. <laughs> sounds Chinese, actually. No, it's from uh, the word... Same root word as horoscope. Makes sense, but Horry. I've never heard of it. Yes. Assuming many of you haven't either. It's a form of divination. So, like, for Horry. example, you would ask a question, like, am I going to get the promotion? Does Are you going to start doing that in the store? Horry. I've done it for people. Do you call it that? No, I call it astrology. astrology. Do you like a horary reading? <laughs> I do. I just call it astrology. <laughs> it sounds like something from Dracula. Yeah, no, I call it yeah. astrology. Uh, but it's a fantastic form of divination. If, uh, if you've never done it or never had it done, it's wonderful. I like it a lot better than most forms of divination. See, this proves you can be in the occult for most of your adult life and still not know what horary is. Yeah, horary. I'm sure I've it. read it somewhere, but it didn't stick in my mind. Yeah, it's um. So like you. Nor cast do the chart. I hear it as a typical conversation. Yeah, you cast the chart for How the are your horary moment. The, the question is <laughs> is asked. The word of today is horary. 
Horary. H O R A R Y. Do you have a chapter on horary? Yes. Oh, you do? An mm-hmm. entire chapter? Yep, an entire chapter. <laughs> it's on how to do the charts. I bet it's right? great, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, but people use it for like. Um, do you give people any cheats? Like you can go get this program here. So yes, I actually them. recommend in the yeah. book. Like I say in the book, if you're going to be a very serious student of astrology, you, sh- you should at least once learn how to cast a chart with an ephemeris, which is like taking the information, using the math, right. making the chart. But once you know how to do it, I actually, every astrologer I know uses I used to always say that I, them, I was the witch in the family and my brother was the astrologist because one of my brothers was really into astrology when he was younger and I just couldn't wrap my, I mean, beyond the uh, archetypes. Yeah. Of course, I love the archetypes, you know. Um, but beyond that, it's just, no, it really. is a lot. Uh, I don't disbelieve in it. It just I think it's it comes it reads as mathematical to me. It is a mathematical universe, that's true. Yeah, and I don't like math. It's funny, I didn't either in school, but I yeah. love astrology. But it's visual. I have learned in the last few years by leading this coven, because I've got coveners who are so good at astrology, it's not something I've taught them planetary magic through the lens of Alexandrian craft. We've explored it together, but it's not really what we're studying, is it? But through them and through having good astrologers in the coven, I've learned a tremendous amount of working with witches who do know a lot about it uh, just in the last few years. But, yeah, we're, we all got our own things. It's not mine. Yeah, everybody's going to have yeah. their own thing in I magic. do love planetary magic, though. I do love that. Yeah. And who knows? You know, three years from now, I could be writing the art less cosmic. <laughs> the art less cosmic. <laughs> Could be happening. Oh, my God. Are you still trying to make the phone work? I thought about it. it. Christian says it might be free if we want to try. We'll try. Yeah, we can try You try, quick. not coming out yelling at <laughs> us in his underwear. I can try it real quick, though, guys. So I'm that's... so tired of you people not listening to me. I'm... Don't you know I'm right? We believe in you. Well... Yeah, it's not really helping us live, is it? <laughs> so I'm going to try real quick, guys, to reconnect. If we can, we'll be able to take your calls again. If not, we will keep them in the chat, and we will answer you as best we can. One moment. Ooh, that well, we're calling Thank outside. you for calling Call-In Studios host and call screener line. Please enter your... Enter your six-digit PIN number. Guys, I think we might have it. Wait, he did it wrong. <laughs> it's Levi's fault. It is my fault. It is my fault. Now, he wanted to be in charge of the call But I could make it work. At least I knew how to make it work. He wanted this power, <laughs> and I let him have it. Christian people showed think, me how to do people it. People think that I'm in control of everything. I'm really just... The... He's here, guys. He's here I with us. I don't know what I am. Thank you for calling Call-In Studios Ooh. host and call screener line. I turned it down. So you all would not have to deal with that horrible feedback. Yeah, it just is invalid show number. My God, we're back to being invalid. Alright, just get off. I tried my best, guys. It's just Um, it's just stupid at this point, so we're not gonna do it. We're going to do better next time. Cutting into the show. Nobody wants to watch people working on technology. I know. So um Yeah. Anyway, we did get a few call ins, not as many, but we do have a great new nifty number for next week month or whatever it's going to be um so there I love, I, tess, tess i entirely agree with you girl <laughs> what did she say she said i love how petulant it sounds what? um the voice on the phone when it's like that is the wrong number oh i know like, right? nerv- i've been made nervous and when i'm nervous i make mistakes <laughs> like yeah uh the only one not nervous is me and tiki yeah you all are not nervous you i am very nervous uh, he might be he's grab- why do you growl when I pick you up? Do you not want the people to see you? You're like, I am not camera ready. Is that what's going on? I'm, you're not camera ready. Is that what it is? He's not. It's that look, that's the look on his face, isn't it? I'm not camera ready. I was not, I'm not down with this. That's why I'm sitting down. Yes, just keep talking about astrology. Agreed. Um, okay, well, um, there's only so much we can talk about astrology, really, isn't there? Um... Questions. I don't know. I, I don't have any more questions about your book that I can think of. Um, just talk about me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you a beautiful mention in the acknowledgement. He's like descended from the goddess Aphrodite. No, I did My not say that. When he wakes up, 
Venus rises like Lucifer in the east. I did not say um, that. Oh, gosh. Um, but I'm I did not. give you a lovely shout out in the acknowledgement. Uh, I haven't. Ooh, I haven't read that. Um, but uh, yeah, oh. and I'm going to be doing a forward for you. Um, yes. Or not a forward, but a blog. Blurg. Blurb. 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 It would be gauche for me to do a forward, obviously. <laughs> gauche, like, he says to me. Well, yes. Cause I I'm, understand you know, why the publisher. Your publisher and your priest, friend yeah. and your high priest would be gauche for me. So Wicked Witch said, what's my favorite part about writing the book? Um, my favorite part was honestly, uh, hmm, I had an answer for that, but now I'm like thinking about certain things. I wrote meditations, guided meditations for every planet. So the first thing you do when you read about the planets in the art cosmic is before you learn their correspondences, before you learn anything about them, you go through a guided meditation to meet them, right? Um, meet them as spiritual beings. And writing those was my absolute favorite. Um, I won't talk about them here because I really want you to read them. Uh, they're my thing I'm the most proud of. But um, I will say I that them. I can tell you this. So I once assigned Levi to come up with path workings for the Kabbalah, for the group, Right. And he created path workings for the entire tree of the Kabbalah. We went through it together as a group. So I know his path workings are very good. Uh, I had a really good experience with that working. Um, I haven't read his planetary path workings yet. They're my favorite. So um, like, I, I can give little hints. You Did know, you give imagery? Lots of imagery. Oh, yeah. So each one is a guided meditation where you're meeting them, but it's not literal. It's not going to say, like, now you're in front of Saturn, or now you're in front of Jupiter. Why are you They're just planets. Me? What does this mean? Anyone a I dog psychologist? Because now he's growling at me. There seems to be no... It's okay to No, me. he's trying to tell me something. I, maybe it's he's sick of the show. I don't know. Like, why are we here? I don't... Why am I, why am I here? Why am I here on Earth? He, maybe it's existential angst. God knows I'm full of that at all times. Um, Seth mentioned earlier a term I do think is important to mention. He said the procession of the equinoxes. Yes, that is what axial tilt also is. The reason why the zodiac no longer lines up to the constellations, right? It's axial tilt, the procession of the equinoxes. And the fact is, is that um, the ancients were aware of this. Most educated yes. astrologers. Well, it's, which is amazing to me even now. But, you know, in craft, right, the, the two luminaries that impact us, really... Um, in the direct sense of the sun and the moon, which are two of the luminaries. And I would assume they are the two luminaries that affected every culture and society first. You know? Absolutely. Uh, which is why they're probably quite prominent in the seven planets. Yeah, the sun and the moon are the, the sort of center ones because you need the sun for agriculture and life, and we measure time. With the <laughs> <laughs> what a night. No idea. He's a Capricorn, too. Maybe there's... A, is there something going on with Capricorns right now? You should check up on that. Yeah, because Stephen asked, do you follow tropical or sidereal? Um, absolutely tropical. So I do not do sidereal astrology. Um, I honor it. I think it's great for people who love it. It does not work for me. Um, when people say they honor something, that means they don't care about it. That's not true. But it's fine. <laughs> that's what, That's literally... <laughs> Brian is calling me out on air. It's very No, mean. that's what it means. You know, oh... I honor... Who says that, first of all? I honor that. Well, it's like... No, you don't. You just don't care about it. You don't have anything against it. I have nothing against it, but I don't practice sidereal astrology. It's all tropical for me. If I could spend the time following you and a couple of other people I'm thinking of in my mind right now around taking out the apologetic, that's what I would do. Take out the apologetic? Oh, I hate the apologetic in the craft today. I think it's really... It's the sensitivity that we, and I'm not, I'm going on a bandwagon that has nothing to do with the subject, but the sensitivity that we, we see, it really is detrimental to the learning process. You know, I don't think teaching is a popularity contest. I don't think it has anything to do with people liking you. You could be the stupidest person in the world and be really popular. You know, I think it's, it's about, uh, you know, sometimes being mean. Sometimes being mean, he says to like me. Like me. I don't know. I've, I, I agree with you on, on a on a Nothing to do with level. astrology. On but, a certain level, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, um, well, there's nothing wrong with being polite. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying be rude. Rude. People are going to pick that up as a meme now that you've said that and everything they hate. They're just going to go, oh, yeah, I honor that. <laughs> it's going to become a way to be mean. It, it, it should be. It's, well, because it's not genuine most of the time. And I don't mean you weren't. Genuine, I know, I know. But I, it's just, you know. Well, I honor your feelings. That's just a nice way of saying, 
I disagree with you, but I'm not trying to piss you off. But I would like you not to be mad at me. Yes, yeah. I'd like you not to be mad. I'd like not to hurt your feelings. Um, yes. Or I hurt you. So there are a couple comments people are making about planetary hours or what time of timing. There is an entire chapter in the Art Cosmic on planetary timing, planetary hours. Um, we, uh, it's a huge part of traditional magic, right? It Which is. were the hours of the day mm-hmm. were assigned in traditional planetary magic. And days of the week. And days mm-hmm. of the week as well, right? So uh, we, you can you can work your magic in timings that are in tune with planet, you know, the planetary system. And I system. do believe that's introduced to us through the Key of Solomon, but might have other sources, um, inversions of the Key of Solomon. I'll say that I have used it. I'm not married to it. Uh, Usually what I'll do if I'm going to do like a pinnacle or something and I'm crafting it, I'll make it on the day and hour. But I might not do the ritual on the day and hour. I, I used to try doing that. Yeah. You know, I used to try doing that. Um, not necessary to me. But I do incorporate the day and the hour. It is. It is. It's a part of a thing. It's a system. It's a thing. Yeah. Right? And there yeah. are more than one. There's more yeah. than one system too. Yeah. So when you do your research, you have to pick which one you're going to use, which is about whether or not you're going to begin at sunset or midnight. I mean, sunrise or midnight. Um, the Magus yeah. has one with the day and hours surrounding the angels. The Key of Solomon has it with the planets. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people got theirs from Paul Husson's book i think that's where i first he does have an yeah ran he has into order, it right? i think it's flawed probably but uh yeah there's all kinds of different things um the christian likes the thing with the seven pointed yep. star and i have that in the book too it teaches you how to use the seven pointed, pointed star um to find out the planetary hours and the days but the days are planetary and then the hours are as well and i do the traditional system which starts the next day so it's based on sunrise and sunset as opposed to strict military time of like midnight or whatever i think because i'm more the ancients would have done that in my rituals if i'm gonna do planetary magic i'm if i'm gonna go there i'm more about the day than the hour but i will say if i'm crafting something and i can mm-hmm. i like to craft it on the day and the hour so i might not make the seal in the ritual i might make the seal on the day and the hour, and then do yes. the ritual. You know, just depends on what I'm doing. You know, I'm a witch. I'm not actually a. I'm not a Solomonic magician. So there is that. Yeah, exactly. And you're going to when you use the planetary hours. The one thing I like about them, beyond whether or not you believe they're necessary, or whether or not you believe they're specifically it's a ritual tied, unto itself. Exactly. Is it so. trains your mind to be disciplined. So you, you start realizing cycles. You know, you start realizing, well, when can I do something? I have to wait for something. Mm-hmm. It stops you from making rash decisions. It makes you plan I do out like that aspect of I it. I like the discipline of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I actually have a whole section in the intro to the car- Art Cosmic where I talk about one of the, all of the things that astrology can teach you, regardless of your background, regardless of if you're a witch or a Christian, regardless of what your religion is. Um, I sort of use it to teach you... I, I list all the things that can teach work. you, oh, and yeah. one of them is discipline, right? Repetition, discipline, all that. So Stephen's asking, do you guys feel that the moon is the gateway for all the other planets to beam upon the Earth surface? That is what a lot of ancient astrologers believed. Um, you know, you actually see this directly quoted in classical astrological sources where they believed the moon was the doorway through which all ethereal or god or divine light sort of came through because it was the closest of the spheres if you don't know i mean you're watching one of the things that's important to understand is that we order the planets how the ancients felt about how far away they were so the closest sphere to earth is the moon right and then you go from which is true exactly (laughs) but it's weird because it's the moon mercury venus the sun mars jupiter and saturn right that's the what we call the chaldean order of the planets right or the ptolemaic order um so i actually do sort of view i will say Stephen, in my magic and maybe this is because i'm an initiate of 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 a witchcraft which is very lunar i do view the moon sort of as Yes, odd, you know, that first place that you kind of have to get to. You know, it is the beginning of an astral journey. I'll have to say that primarily, primarily my magic is not planetary, right? So when it is planetary, it's usually based on the metals and the colors, honestly. Then the archetypes, and then the days and the hours. But most of the time when I approach magic, I'm not going to say, ooh, let's make this planetary. I can't explain why sometimes I do. (laughs) You know, magic, right? Uh, I will say that I've done two very powerful rituals that were completely planetary. 
but done in a, rich, a witchcraft setting mm-hmm. and with a bit of creativity. So I'd used the Key of Solomon. I created elaborate pentacles, you know, um, and I'd done it, you know, I think I crafted them on the day and the hour, and but then I brought them into coven, so I didn't do it on the day and hour, but I crafted them on the day and hour. So the day and hour was brought into the work by me making them because they were elaborate. They weren't something just drawn out on a piece of paper. And so I put a lot into it and I still have them. And they were both big things. They were both very effective. But of course I incorporated that into my craft. You know, and that's the whole thing about planetary magic is it's not necessarily reserved for a tradition. You can bring it into anything, really. Yes. Tess has a good... She brought up... um, the Chaldean order is based on how quickly the planets move across the sky. Correct. When I was saying that they're ordered that way, Tess, what I mean is is in a lot of works on magic, they'll view them as a journey, right? And they'll list them in a way so that you begin with the moon and end with Saturn, and it's, and then beyond that is the prima mobile and then the Empyrean heaven of God. So it was seen as sort of an elevation or a journey of the soul, right? But yes, they, that is the, the historical reason for why they were listed is because the moon moves quickly across the night sky and Saturn takes a much longer time, right? So that is absolutely... Maybe the weirdest yeah. question I've ever seen. We'll see. Um, there was one before that I wanted to hit, though. Um, okay. Uh, excuse me. Um, are there daily or weekly rituals um, to help you get in the rhythm of it, in the rhythm of astrology, I'm assuming you mean, um, for a, the sake of a better you know, word? So, uh, yes, actually. Um, one of the big ones that I recommend in the book is to start incorporating the planetary hours. That will be one thing you can do. Like, start timing things, right? And you, and you will start to fall into a cycle, right? A disciplined cycle of magic. The other one is to base things on the moon cycles. That's a huge thing that we do. Um, and I think that's a very wonderful way to approach that as well. So that could be a basis for ritual so that you're approaching it from that cyclical point of view, that you're required to stick to something. You're required to see it through to the end. You're not simply doing it rashly. You know, you're really putting your whole mind and soul into it, concentration and intention. Like, those are parts of, of things that you can do for that. Um, which I love. The other thing that I do recommend is stargazing, which I have a whole thing in the book about this, but um, I actually recommend building relationships with the stars you can see regularly. It will be different depending on where you live. You'll have a different experience. If you live in the country. Yeah, it could be a whole different experience. You're really blessed. Yeah, Yeah. and whether or not you have a lot of light pollution Mm -hmm. will change that, but sometimes it's worth a drive. Here in New Orleans, the sky's weird because we do have a lot of light pollution, but it always feels like the sky's closer to me here than it is in other places. Uh, but I don't. when I when I have the pool, I do get I do look at the stars yeah. and you know uh, gaze. I usually don't see anything. <laughs> like, be, yeah. I, I do occasionally see a few planets, or if I know the planets are out there, I see them. I can recognize Venus. That's a really easy one. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter, even if you don't know anything about it. Just going out there and realizing that that's a part of the that's a part of nature, right? To the fact that you look up at the night sky and see all these brilliant lights, like that is inspired more than we possibly can imagine, you know, from religion to science. Those stars have inspired. I'm so sorry, guys. I, somebody's saying that we skipped a question from Rodriguez Mystic. I haven't seen one. I don't, I don't really know what the question is. I'm so sorry if it got skipped. I didn't and, see it. And we can skip questions if we want to because it's our show and not yours. <laughs> I didn't see it. I think we need to remember that slogan. But no, we didn't see the question. No, no, no. We do sometimes skip questions if they're just something we don't want to answer. Um, Or if they're loaded or stupid. But yes, Wicked Witches, um, I agree with you. When you're in the country and you watch the night sky, it is a very different Uh, experience. um, It's really fantastic. It is. And, you know, the best feeling ever, an initiatory feeling almost, and we've all had it, is laying on your back in the grass looking at the stars for a long time, you'll start feeling real weird, you know. I've, I've had that sort of almost, like, agoraphobic feeling because you almost mm-hmm. feel like you're going to go falling out. It's just too much open space. It's too yeah. much open space. It's too space. much open space. Um, but it's magnificent. Okay, here it is. Um, do any of the rituals provide a means of protecting yourself from unfavorable planetary conditions? Yes, but I will say this. Um, historically, in my experience, what I've read from most planetary magic sources is that it's more about avoidance. So if, if you were wanting to work magic and the position of Saturn, for example, or um, the position of the moon was in an incredibly negative position for the work, most sources I've read would tell you to wait. 
Um, they would not say that you need to do some elaborate ritual to protect your influences from something malign or malefic, right? They would instead argue that it was all about um, it was all about timing correctly, which I think is a better way to approach it. But if you wanted to do it, you could. There are ways that you can, like he's saying, like magic circles and different forms of protection, invoking certain spirits. Absolutely, you could. But it's not how I would approach teaching it. How I would approach teaching it is it's better to learn the cycles and the timing than it is to try to force them in one way or the other. One of the main reasons we use astrology is to understand the cycles of the cosmos. So I wouldn't want you to fight against them, right, if you didn't have to. The whole point, you know, I would actually, if somebody said to me, well, it's really important I do this magic, it's urgent. Well, then maybe you don't need to use astrological magic because it's not very good at things like that. Astrological magic is cosmic in its, in its concepts, and it really does want you to understand timing and discipline. Right. One of the things that I've learned in the occult is when you get into systems that are working with tides, like tides of events, you know, whether it's equinoxes or the full moon or whatever, those are things that you're going to have to invest in. They're not instant. You know, they are meant for those tides. They're usually secular in nature, you know, so you've kind of almost got a way to cycle whatever that cycle is. Obviously, the cycle of the moon is much quicker than the cycle of the sun or the zodiac. You know. Um, yes. So. Planetary tides, I'm not really. That, you know, <laughs> like I don't know those very well. But um, if you're going to get into it, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to be really ebbing and flowing with what with what's going on with those planets and where they are in relation to where you are in yeah. perception. And as you know, Rodriguez Mystic was talking about, like you. Certain magicians would keep out unwanted planetary things. That's true. Um, they did believe that certain planets... They split the planets up into benefic and malefic in, in old world astrology. You know, Mars and Saturn being the great malefics. Um, and Venus and Jupiter being the most benefic of the planets. Jupiter being the great malefic, Venus being the lesser benefic. Both both seem very... Um, um, very, 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 very much seen that way. You know, I will say this. Modern astrology is very keen on removing concepts of negative and positive. Like, there's no real bad planets. There's no real good planets. It's all gray and it's all based on relationship. I don't disagree with that point of view at all, but I will say in traditional sources, they're much more black and white. you got to remember this was born in Christendom. This was born in, you know, and even though it predates that, but the magic is born in Christendom. And so... Survived in. Exactly. <laughs> in you know, spite of. They're very... Yeah. Um, they're very... Uh, they're much more blunt than we are. Like, I write about this a lot in The Art Cosmic, that you'll, one of the things that shocks people when they read traditional astrology books is they talk about death a lot, and they talk about negativity a lot, and fate, and they're not as hippy-dippy and sweet and gentle. Did you see the post I think. made on my wall the other night with all the negative signs? It's a video. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, I love those. There's a book that they did, it Born in a Bad Sign. It's just when people look at these, and they're like, this is all the horrible qualities about these signs. I love yeah. that. Uh, Tank is here to teach us a very valuable astrological thing. That he's cute? That anyone can be replaced. Even tiki, tiki. Even Tiki. Because <laughs> Tank's not going to growl. He's just like, why am I here? Yeah. He's like, Tank is like Eeyore. He he's really so is, isn't he? So we're Never at, a complaint. We're at the end. Oh yeah, Tess, I do agree. I call it positive fascism too. You don't want to be too positive, right? Um... Yeah, there's got to be some room for negativity. Mars can be quite violent. The problem Saturn with can be a mean teacher. The problem with uh, positivity focusing, which is a huge part of the some people's culture, you know, wellness culture. I think you guys were yeah. calling it last week. Is it's not realistic. You know, um, do you know anyone who's not ever mean? You know? Exactly. Uh, some of them just hide it better than others, but you know, it is what it is. So. Um, no, I'm very excited. So to sum it up, yes. Levi Rowland's book, The Art Cosmic, um, which is the second book published by Warlocks Press. We've got others on their way, and we're really excited about it. Are you doing a class on WitchCon about it? Yeah, my class on, for WitchCon is on planetary magic. We'll explain. Yeah, it's a good so promotion. if you're going to um, participate in WitchCon, if you haven't bought your tickets yet, I highly recommend that you do. Um, WitchCon is happening March 5th through 7th, I believe. Um, it is a fantastic, amazing amalgamation of teachers from so many different traditions and, and systems. Just, it's insane how many people are, are participating in this. It's amazing. Um, but I will be teaching a class on planetary magic, um, you know, to prepare for the Art Cosmics release, which is happening in May or June. Um, and is available for pre-order on hexwitch.com. Oh, and I think I should probably suggest maybe Christian could have him on um, 
on Hex Offenders. I could call in, right? Pro- yes, or and or be here. How about right, since maybe? Hex Offenders is, is, is all about the, the, the haters, I will. Um, you want me to read their charts? We'll find their birthdays. It'll be a new I form of doxing. I will say <laughs> the program about your book is the one we have got our first haters on. I know. I'm low. It's historic. I understand. No, it means something about it was pushing somebody's buttons. Maybe, could be. Could be timing as well. Um, but also, uh, Levi, so he'll be doing, so if you want to know more about his system of planetary magic and what, how it may relate, um, you can get him on WitchCon and uh, pre-order his book. Absolutely. Um, you'll get a signed copy if you pre-order it. Mm-hmm. Um, Get signed copy by Levi. And it has been an absolute pleasure, guys. I hope you enjoy the book. I put a lot of heart and soul into it. It is it is a wonderful I'm very excited about it. Um, every task that I, you know, as a teacher have set before Levi, and everything he's ever done to contribute to the training of our coven has been magnificent. Like he's done work with the tarot, he's done work with the Kabbalah. And so this, I didn't have him do astro- uh, planetary work in the coven. Um, I did handle that myself. But maybe not in the future, right? <laughs> maybe not in the so, future. We'll see. But, but it's been anyway, a pleasure. Uh, very exciting. Um, thank you all for uh, calling. So next week, I thought, or next time we do this, probably next week. Tonight, I'm not, you know, <laughs> driving with it. Probably do it here next week. I thought a good show we've never done, getting back to the core of the show BTW, is. A show on the elders of the craft. Oh, I love that. We've never actually done it, so we and what talk a perfect, about each of them. Do you know what today is? No. It's the anniversary of Joe Gardner's death. I did not know So that. look at the, the perfect kismet. Today was the day um, that Joe Gardner died, February 12th. Well, that would so. have been the day for it, but uh, farewell, you know, Skyr, you know, uh, bless him, uh, magnificent messenger of the gods. Yes, right. so I'm, I, I'm, I'm very happy about that. That's kind of cool kismet that you I did not do. know that. I know, right? Yeah. Cool kismet, um, right? But, you know, I thought, oh, because, we, you know, we, we do try to keep this show, the subject is primarily BTW, Alexandrian Gardnerian, because there aren't very many shows or any like that. Yeah. And, you know, they're all, you know, teenage girls telling you how to light candles. You know? So, so hateful. It is what it is. Well, I'm not saying it's bad. It's I just, know. That's what's but out yes, there. But, yes, I love that idea for the yeah. next show. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Please have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time. Bye. Goodbye.